Part 1 In a world destroyed, in a city rebuilt from the ashes, there were no governments, no authorities, save the sects. They took one look at the chaos in what was once New York City and for some reason became the law. Territories were formed, each one under the control of one sect. And there was order. Save for the gray area in between, that space where common people, the rejects, unable to find a place with either. Chaos still ruled these streets, veiled by the shadows of the sects that lurked, waiting, poised to gain the tiniest bit of space, to take over the city. And I knew firsthand just how it could get. I walked through the streets, empty even that early in the night, the only sound being the echo of my footsteps. The moon shone down, full and bright, casting an eerie glow on the buildings. I knew from experience that some were deserted, the others occupied by the most unsavory characters. Even though I was well aware of the risk I took, no one walked around this area after the sun went down, I wasn't scared. Quite the opposite, really. I liked the empty streets, and there was no one that could seriously threaten me, save for the head of the Rift, who was also my adoptive father. I wasn't scared of the dark streets, but I felt a shiver run down my spine. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. As I turned a corner, I stopped in my tracks my hand drifting to the pistol in my belt holster. A menacing creature, unlike anything I had ever seen before, was right in the middle of the alley. It was at least seven feet tall and covered in thick, matted fur. Its eyes glowed with a fierce yellow light, staring down at me, and its sharp, pointed teeth glinted in the moonlight. I froze at the canine-like smile it gave me. Unable to move or even scream. No one would answer anyway. The creature let out a deafening roar, running to me so fast that it almost vanished. I turned around and fled as quickly as I could. My limbs trembled as waves of adrenaline crashed through them, but I kept on going. My mind raced even faster than my heart, planning my escape route. I could have turned around to fight, but with the slight glimpse I got, it was best for me to keep on running and hope I could lose it. I could feel its hot breath on my neck as I ran for my life. My heart pounded in my chest as I zigzagged through the narrow alleys, trying to shake the creature off my tail. But it was no use. That thing moved with supernatural speed knocking into walls that were in its way and going clean through without even stopping for a microsecond. It was too strong. I ran even faster, feeling the sting from the raining debris. It gained on me with every step, and I realized that it was just messing with me like a cat plays with its prey before a meal. I could feel the hunger in its gaze, the hunger for all flesh. But at that moment, it wanted mine. As I reached the end of the alley, I saw my only chance for escape. A rickety old fire escape ladder was hanging from the side of a building. I leapt for it, grabbing onto the ladder with all my strength. I began to climb, my hands shaking as I pulled myself higher and higher. But the creature was right behind me. It leapt for the ladder, its razor-sharp claws tearing into the metal and tried to jump after me. I could feel its hot breath on my heels and I rushed as much as I could until I reached the top of the ladder and pulled myself onto the roof. I lay there for a moment, panting and sweating, but I knew the creature was still below, waiting for me to come back down. I had to keep moving. I climbed to my feet and ran across the rooftop. I could hear the creature's roars growing louder and louder, following me yet again. I could see its yellow eyes glowing in the darkness behind me and lighting up the way like little spotlights in the dark. 
And then I saw it. The edge of the roof. The only way out. I jumped off the edge, my stomach dropping as I fell. But I had calculated it wrong, and I landed on a nearby rooftop instead of the far one I had aimed for, rolling to break my fall. I got up, my heart racing and my head spinning. I wasn't safe. I knew that the creature followed, heard its growls as it leapt the same distance I did, and skidded to a stop right in front of me, claws digging into the roof. Its presence was like a dark shadow, and I could sense the evil emanating from it. I couldn't run, though. I couldn't even pick up the pistol lying on the roof a few inches from my hand. I had been running for what felt like hours, and I was exhausted. So I just lay, panting, and watched it as it watched me. But instead of attacking, it spoke to me in a deep and menacing voice. Do not trust those around you, it warned. They are not what they seem. I looked at it, speechless. It repeated itself and growled at the puzzled look on my face. Are you stupid, human? You need to leave that posse you run around with. It mumbled something about just eating me and saving itself the trouble under its breath that stunk of carrion, and then dropped into the space beside me with a bang. I looked up at it, my throat closing at the sheer mass of toned muscles covered by matted silver pelt. I cleared my throat. What do you mean? Leave. It growled again, bearing its jagged canines at me, and I knew it was barely restrained. It truly wanted to kill me. You heard me. Just get out of here. I've done my fucking job by warning you. Now get out of my sight, unless you have a death wish. It clambered to its hind legs, and just as it was about to leave, I spoke on impulse, hating myself for every single word that left my lips. So, the guard dog is all bark and no bite. It spun even faster than I could have imagined and wrapped a claw-tipped paw around my throat. My vision flipped, and then I was back up against the wall, staring into the yellow eye of the enraged beast that pinned my body to the wall. Its paw, surprisingly and to my own detriment, worked just like a hand did, squeezing and pushing against my windpipe. I gasped for breath, my eyes wide with fear. The beast was unrelenting, crushing my throat with its grip till stars danced in my eyes. I tried to scream, to say something, to beg, but no sound came out. The beast's canine maw was twisted in a cruel smile, enjoying my terror. I glanced at its paw, trying to pry them off my neck, but it was no use. When my vision began to blur and my legs gave way beneath me, It let me go, and I choked as a stream of cool night air flooded into my lungs. It chuckled, a sinister thing, and asked me to go investigate what the rift actually wanted from me. Think of it as a favor from the Croy. I bent at the knees, still gulping down as much air as I could, and winced as I forced myself to look up and asked why, my voice hoarse. It gave me a feral grin, yellow eyes glinting. Do what I asked, and you'll find out soon enough. I staggered to my feet, aware of its gaze on me as I walked to the edge of the roof. Why didn't you kill me immediately, if you're this powerful? The fetid stench of carrion floated in the breeze, and I knew it was amused. I had a task to fulfill. But you can be sure. It paused and I knew its teeth flashed. When I find you next time, it will end differently. I leapt off the roof to the fire escape of a nearby building and felt my entire body thrum in pain. 
I didn't look back the whole way down. But as I walked away, I couldn't shake the feeling that the beast was still watching me, waiting for me to let my guard down so it could strike again. I knew that it was only a matter of time before our paths crossed once more, and I wasn't sure if I would be able to survive the encounter. I walked through the empty streets, never looking back, but I still felt the phantom yellow eyes on me, until I was out of sight. It seemed to linger, like something oily and slimy, on the back of my neck. Part 2 I remember the day he found me, or the day I found him. I had been wandering the streets of New York for days, begging for scraps to survive. I was four years old and was as scrawny as a three-year-old for the year or so I spent alone, having lost my parents in a car accident, right in the middle of the gray area. I was scared and alone, with no one to turn to and I couldn't even return to my home. I had forgotten where it was. Delirious with hunger, I did something that in hindsight would have earned me a trip to the afterlife. I tried to steal from a member of a sect. Seeing as I was just a child, and the sect leader was close by, I wasn't killed immediately. That was the first time I had seen Kylian the tall, devilishly handsome man with a heart of shadows and steel. He had taken one look at me and said I was coming with him. All I had wanted was food, but I got so much more. I was trained in the arts of negotiation and business, in the use of firearms, and eventually became an integral part of the rift. I rose quickly through their ranks and was soon the next trusted member after the inner circle. I found a family in the rift, one set on erasing the bridge between the sects and the people. The rift believed in the assimilation, uniting the people of the city so we could all share the resources, and so did I. It was clear I had a place there. Now I crept through the keep as we called the compound with three skyscrapers where the entire base operation of the rift was located, on nothing more than a suggestion by a member of the Croy. The Croy were the only other sect that controlled the city, and, from all indications, were as evil as they got. So evil that they could engineer whatever that thing was, they were to blame for more than half of the skirmishes between the two sects for years, and I'd had so many close calls, both business-wise and in life-and-death situations over the years, that I hated every single member I had ever met. The events of this night were just the latest in a string of bad interactions with the Croy. I nodded to a pair of guards, flanking either side of the doors to the main building where the top members of the Rift lived, and seeing their return salute made me feel very guilty for what I was about to do. I tried to talk myself into leaving it alone, but a part of me needed to know for sure, if only so I could have a reason to kill that wolf-man thing if I ever saw it again. Either way, I thought, as I checked the corridors for anyone who would see what I was about to do. There was no one, so I snuck in and locked the door behind me. I trusted Kylian, and I trusted the rift, but something in me begged to be sure. And the one place where I could find something had to be in Kylian's room. I began to turn his room upside down, searching through drawers and cupboards, but nothing seemed out of place. I was beginning to think I was wasting my time when something caught my eye. There was a tiny crack in the wall behind his desk. I pushed on the wall, and a secret door opened. Behind the wall was a small room filled to the brim with so many books and charts that I thought I was seeing things, and in the center of the room was a computer hub, 
I was to find out that it was completely separate from the main server we used. I stepped inside, my blood slowing as I took in everything. I knew of every single computer connected to the network, but this one was definitely not in my records. The computer hub was connected to dozens of wires and cables. I couldn't even begin to guess what it was used for. I searched it for clues, but I couldn't find anything. It was locked with a password and everything I had tried didn't work. I decided to look around at the charts and books. I had no idea what exactly I was trying to find, but I knew it wasn't what I did find. Every single piece of paper, every book, and every chart was filled with occultic symbols and spells. The symbols were crudely drawn, and the words barely legible, but I could make out enough to know that the content was dark and ancient. I recognized some of the symbols from books I had read, and the transcripts told of dark, evil magic and mysterious rituals. My heart raced fast as I skimmed through the pages, wondering what kind of secrets these ancient texts held. I had heard stories of dark rituals in remote forests and abandoned buildings, and here I was, standing in a room full of books and charts of spells and symbols that told exactly how to bring any of such creatures to life. I felt a chill run through me as I realized the implications of what I had found. I had stumbled upon a kind of ancient knowledge, the kind that was said to be able to open the gates of hell. I didn't know if it was true or not, but I knew I had to leave this place as soon as possible. The hair on my hands and neck stood on end. I felt like I was being watched. I looked around, terrified. Then I noticed something strange. There was a camera pointed directly at the computer hub. I had a feeling that this was not normal. I quickly disconnected the cables and removed the camera. I was terrified at what I might find. I plugged the camera into my communicator that doubled as a smartphone and started to search through the footage. I saw Kylian typing away on the computer hub, but I couldn't make out what he was doing. I kept scrolling through the footage until I saw something that made my blood run cold. I saw Kylian talking to someone on the computer hub. I couldn't make out who he was talking to, but I knew that voice. It belonged to one of the six, one of the Inner Circle members. When I heard his words, a cold sweat broke across my forehead. Everything is set. The only piece left for the night of assimilation is Darcel. Don't worry. He will be ready. I refused to think about what I'd heard and scrolled through some more footage until I got to what I needed. His password. I typed it in, feeling a bead of sweat travel down my neck. This was it. Regardless of what I thought I heard, that would be the moment of truth. My jaw dropped lower and lower with every file, with every truth that I discovered until I was almost heaving. He was the real reason my parents were dead. They used to be high-ranking Croy members. Kylian had discovered that their bloodlines contained a strong trace of the force that connected worlds, and for his plan for world domination to work, he needed them out of the picture so he could get to me. All the years of learning the old ways, of serving the Rift like it was my only family, this was what it amounted to. I shoved my way out the secret room and was greeted by Kylian's form just in the doorway. My heart slammed to a stop in my chest and I rubbed at my neck subconsciously. Kylian smiled, but it didn't reach his cold blue eyes. Going somewhere? I stammered, thinking of what to say. I hated him so much in that moment that the pain in my chest felt like a tidal wave of pressure, threatening to kill me and anyone remotely close to me. 
He saw how quiet I was and smiled, and then stepped aside to reveal the empty passageway. So, you know about everything. What now? His voice was mocking. If you can't stand me so much, then leave. I had only two options. Either I stay and be the reason the world changes forever, or I could go to the Croy and use what I knew to help them defeat the Rift. With everything I learned, there was only one viable option. I walked past him, so close I could hear his shallow breathing in the space between us. I had walked a few feet into the corridor when I felt his eyes on me and turned. My heartbeat spiked, almost slamming through my ribcage at the look in his eyes. Run, he mouthed. I took off. I had no idea what I was running from, only that I had to. I was certain that if I stayed, I'd be killed. My heart raced and my feet pounded the pavement beneath me as I fled through the streets of New York City. I had been warned about the rift, and with everything I just found out, I knew I had to get away before they caught me. My only hope was to find a way to escape. I had already run for a few minutes away from the keep, feeling rather than seeing that I was being followed. That's when I saw it. The large, silver wolf standing in the middle of the street, calling to me to get on. Before I could think twice, I jumped onto its back and it took off. I clung to its fur as it galloped through the night, dodging the obstacles and buildings in our way. We raced through alleys and side streets, its paws pounding against the pavement. I could feel its heart beating as fast as my own, and even though it remained silent as I told it everything I had found out, I knew it was just as scared as I was. We seemed to be gaining some ground, but the rift was still close behind us, and with whatever Kylian sent after us just 50 meters away and closing in fast, I knew they weren't human. Not if they could keep up with the speed the Wolfman ran. Suddenly, it leaped over a fence and I found myself in a large, empty park. The trees were tall and menacing, and I could feel the darkness pressing against us. Suddenly, I heard a loud howling, and I knew the rift were near. The Wolfman had no choice but to keep running, and we raced through the park, dodging trees and bushes. My heart pounded in my chest as I let it take control. It seemed to know where to go, and as far as I could tell was heading to the Croy parts of the city, so I was grateful for his guidance. We ran through the city, dodging cars and weaving in and out of alleyways. I could hear a faint howling in the distance, and I knew it was only a matter of time before they found me. I tried to focus on the task at hand, but I couldn't help but think of the horrors I had seen. I had just seen what they were capable of, and I had no intention of becoming their next ticket to power. I had to stay one step ahead of them, or I'd be doomed. Finally, we reached the edge of the park and I saw the bright lights of the city in the distance. The wolfman leapt over a gate and we were out in the open again. I held on tight as the wolfman galloped away from the park and back towards the city. The rift seemed to have given up the chase because I didn't hear any signs of pursuit, and I finally breathed a sigh of relief. My relief was short-lived. My heart raced and my breathing quickened as the wolfman set me to the ground, and in the next second, a shadow slammed into it. I pulled out a gun while they battled, my palms sweaty as I tried to get an opening, but they were moving around too much. I had thought we had escaped, the wolfman and I, but I was wrong. The rest of the shadows had found us, their long black cloaks swishing as they moved through the night like ghosts. Suddenly, we were surrounded just as it knocked the shadow off. The wolfman and I locked eyes, its breath coming in short gasps. We both knew what was coming. I'll be damned if I let them take you, it snarled, baring its teeth at them. It pushed me behind it and yelled at me to run, just as the shadows moved closer, their eyes glowing red in the darkness. I wanted to run. I tried to, but my feet were frozen in place. 
They fought, and the wolf man was a vision of viciousness as he put his claws to good use. I almost thought it would win, but the wolf man staggered away from them for a few steps, and I tried to move forward when I saw the blood dripping, already forming a pool at its feet. It let out a loud growl and lunged at the shadows. I heard the sound of metal slicing through flesh, and it seemed like a dream as the wolf man's lifeless body fell to the ground. The shadows turned towards me, their eyes full of hate. I wanted to scream, but my voice was lost. Before I could do anything, I felt a sharp pain on the back of my head and everything went dark. When I awoke, I was alone. Part 3 As I made my way up the steps, I felt a weight settle on my shoulders. This was it. I had only one choice left to make, and I had to choose between the family I found and the family that never stopped looking for me. I owed the Rift my life, and even though they were the very reason I was separated from my parents, there was a life debt to be paid. Life debts had to be paid. It was a law far older than any the sects made, and I knew this was the only way. <laughs> Didn't make it any easier, though. The wind blew through my hair like chilly fingers as I stepped out of the stairwell and onto the roof of the tallest building in the entire city. I snorted as I spied the seven figures in red cloaks waiting for me. Six stood in a circle, each at the point of a six-pointed star drawn on the concrete, and the last stood in the middle. The night was darker, the moon hiding behind the largest rain clouds I had ever seen, as though it couldn't bear to see what was about to happen as it continued on its journey. My guard, who had huffed far behind me as I climbed the stairs, made to shove his staff in my back, but was stopped by the figure in the center of the hooded red cloaks. Let him be. He needs to do this of his own free will. The hood was pulled off in one fluid movement, and I was faced with the person who started it all. It was fitting he would be the one to end it, too. I spat at his feet, and the guard jammed his staff into my back, knocking me to the ground. My knees barked as they landed on the hard cement. Darcel of the Rift, born of the enemy and spared from death by the family, do you consent to yielding your life force to bring the day to existence? Yes, I whispered. I almost laughed where I kneeled as he started the chants in a deep, guttural voice. The way he spoke made it seem like I actually had a choice, like I could stop what was to come. I knew I couldn't. There was no free will. My heart threatened to jump out of my chest as the song-like chants reached a crescendo. The thought that I was going to die. But I pushed it down. It was no secret that I was always willing to die for the rift, and die I would, but not for the reason they thought it was. My mind calmed as a dry, hot wind that smelled, unsurprisingly, like sulfur blew in from everywhere and nowhere all at once. I couldn't even force myself to feel scared when the symbols drawn on the concrete of the roof glowed red, or when the floor beneath me disappeared and I knelt on thin air, hovering over a red chasm that grew with every second. The red-cloaked figures fled from their positions, and so did Kylian. I was all alone, and the only company I had was the entity that emerged from the abyss with a plume of smoke. I coughed, struggling to move with everything I had but it seemed like my body was frozen in place. A snowstorm raged outside the sphere of heat I was locked in, and cold dread called to me, 
mixing with the heat in a deadly cocktail that overwhelmed my senses. I heard the sounds first, of bones breaking and then of flowing blood, and I lay confused, wondering how he wound up spread-eagled and stretched over the chasm. I wondered where the pain had come from and what had caused the wave-like pulse of rotten flesh odor from the hell's realm below. My answer brought fear, true fear, with it, and demanded I submit. It was huge, way bigger than anything I had ever seen in my entire life, and even the wolf thing paled in comparison. A giant, monstrous figure emerged from the depths. It had long, razor-sharp claws, scales on every inch of it that I could see, and a mouth full of sharp teeth. It was horribly long, like a hybrid cross between a centipede and a wolf, and its eyes were glowing with a sinister yellow hue. I screamed, the only action my bound body allowed, but my voice was drowned out by its terrifying roar. I shook with fear as I tried desperately to break free of the binds on my mind, but it was no use. I was trapped, with no way of escape. The monster advanced towards me, its teeth gleaming in the light from the yawning chasm. I closed my eyes and prayed for a miracle, but there was none. I was doomed. I felt my strength flag as it emerged into the pale light of the coming dawn. At this rate, just bringing it into this world was going to take everything. I slumped, defeated. There was no way I could stop it. Still, as the monster's tentacles groped every inch of me, tasting the energy that flooded from my body into its own, I spoke to it, my voice quiet. It barely carried on the wind, but I knew it heard me. According to the old laws, I deserve to have a fulfilled last wish. Speak. And it will be done. My ears shook as it replied from its wolf-like snout in a voice that was equal parts guttural and small. The contrast didn't make sense, but it did. I turned to the building that Kylian no doubt watched me from and smiled. It was wide, so wide that if I were him, I would be worried. I knew what he truly wanted. Power. Absolute power. But I knew the Croy would use it better. I could get even. In the best way possible. The cold fingers of my fear, or relief now that I thought about it, squeezed my heart, but I didn't mind. I looked the Dade in the eyes. Any power you get from this encounter, from my sacrifice, must be sent to the matriarch, Croy. The day didn't speak again, but the light flared for a second. When it cooled, and my vision with it, I felt smug at my last glimpse of life. Kylian stood on the very edge of the roof. A spirit flare in one hand, a double-barreled gun in the other, and a look of sinister rage and pure fury on his face. If I didn't feel so tired, I would have smiled and taunted. But the smell of sulfur and the pure, undiluted heat streaming from the rapidly growing Dade lulled me to sleep. For once, I was glad to go, because the night of assimilation was ending with the rising sun, and I couldn't care less what would happen next. We weren't even born as a species. We weren't even a glimmer in evolution's eyes. We were simply non-existent. 
Yet, they thrived as one of the biggest and grandest civilizations in the universe, if not also one of the youngest, oldest from our perspective, actually. It took them close to 35 million years to reach our galaxy and solar system from their own. So, you can imagine their surprise when they realized that there were other life forms out there. The reason why we called the Discovery our own was because we had spotted them inadvertently when we were mapping out the brightest galaxies some three centuries before their arrival. We didn't know what we were looking at back then, and that they weren't even looking. It was a funny story, and it sounded like it could have been the perfect intergalactic meet cute until they actually got here. They appeared in our skies as gods would, distant, superior, and unimaginably powerful. On the way here, they had evolved, changed, mutated, and persevered so much more than can ever be described from our minuscule Earthling perspective. Everything that they had achieved in their generational spaceship convoy on a technological level cannot be understated, either. The complexity of their technology made calling it magic the most appropriate thing. Whatever had been left from their base civilization was completely unknown to them when they arrived here, and even less of it can be known to us. Ever. They had created not one, but hundreds of thousands of space-faring, space-born civilizations that had risen and fallen right on the main spaceship and spawned its many satellite ships over time. The guiding vessel, or the main ship, which we can only presume was the first, if the first was ever even preserved, held only the highest ranking officials and royals. Its name, as much as we would eventually translate it, was The Ground I Walk On. None of them remembered why they left their home. So our biggest guest came from calculations our scientists made long ago. The consensus among the scientific community was that their sun had collapsed upon itself, rendering their homeworld uninhabitable. However, the extraterrestrials seemed generally uninterested in the place they came from. They behaved as if they had always been on those vessels, as if their many feet had never been pulled down by gravity that wasn't artificial. And, in a way, that was true. When we asked them if they had made any colonies along the way, considering the technologies they possessed and the many potential life-bearing planets they had passed, they could not wrap their minds around it. In fact, most of the royals referred to themselves as space-born, as if it were some kind of status symbol within their current societal structure. All of this information was something that we weren't cognizant of in the beginning, as you may already know. It took centuries under their dominance and guidance for us to finally be able to understand fragments of their language and history. This is why I'm recording this story for you, Bobo, so that you too can know of them, and so that you don't resent them. But mostly, I want you to understand what your big sis did for you, Bobo so that you don't hate me anymore either. What had started as an innocent mission of peace a few centuries ago, led by others like Grandfather, had turned into something much more important. Before him, and later also me, none had stepped on the great vessel that led the convoy. While our predecessors were granted only access to the satellite ships, Grandfather and I were the only two humans that had ever boarded the main ship in the centuries since their arrival, and the only two that had ever laid eyes on the spaceborne. I was always aware of how you down there called us, and the others that ascended before us. I couldn't blame you for it. From your perspective, we were collaborators. However, I and all those before me saw ourselves as your champions, my first day on board the main ship was blanketed by so much overwhelm that I can barely remember it as I do any other day of my life. I'm not even sure how I even got them to notice me and take me on board their most treasured vessel, 
To even perceive what was around me took me quite some time. Then, the advance to understand what I began to perceive was aided by Grandfather, who had been there for the better part of at least five decades, possibly even more. Clad in an all-white gown, with the air of holy wisdom around him, he was more than glad to have another of his own join him in his mission. Grandfather had almost lost hope that those of us left on the surface of Earth could still see the glory and importance of our cosmic visitors turned saviors. His days were numbered as a human, and I was to take his place as ambassador. My work would allow me knowledge beyond the scope of the human mind that I, for now, still possess, and will, until I as well am replaced. However, that cycle will not continue forever. Once the last living human is incorporated within the body of the saviors, there will be no need for ambassadors. It is then, Bobo, when you will have realized that you have never had any alternatives. This cosmic convoy will be joined with humanity. It remains your choice whether you will accept the loving embrace of the spaceborn, or be called like cattle. My task as ambassador is to advise you to decide upon the former. My wish, as your sister, is for you to choose it gladly. What I now think was the first year on board the ground I walk on was the first year of my new life. Nothing can compare to it, Bobo. Not even giving birth to my first, and not even giving birth to my second daughter. Grandfather had often recalled his beginnings on the ship, and he would often compare his initial hardships to my current privilege of having someone guide me on the road already taken by him. He didn't have the advantage of shared language, and certainly not the advantage of being treated as a living being with biological and psychological needs. The spaceborn were unaware that he needed food to sustain his body, and even less that he needed companionship to sustain his mind. By his description, he was more of a pet and a plaything to them than he was ever an equal being. It took him getting dangerously ill for the spaceborn to realize that if he were to live, they would have to take care of him properly. The accounts of others that had lived and died on the satellite ships show a much different picture about the treatment they got there, and that had its own reasons. Whatever changes that had happened on a grander scale among the extraterrestrials, they happened on the main ship. However, the other changes, the lesser ones, the painful ones that needed more blood and sweat to be overcome, those changes were strictly kept within the boundaries of the satellites. This is why the ambassadors that had ascended to those ships were treated as fleshy beings that hurt and die. The spaceborn had no notion of these things. The ground I walk on was stripped from disease eons ago, and there is very little account of how the old beings who lived on that ship truly are. I am certain that they do perish eventually, if anything by their own hand, but they are as indifferent to it as you or I are indifferent to breathing. This might make them seem cruel, and even brutal at times, I know. But that is simply a problem of method, not a problem of intent. Evil wants to hurt, Bobo. However, they simply have no conception of that. Not anymore. And surely, not for a very long time. Can you even fathom the time span it took them to arrive close to our little speck of dust in the vast universe? I dare not imagine that the consequences of longevity are those... For how could I ever wish that for myself? For you. And for all. I battled with these questions since I became aware of them, and made my peace by choosing an answer. This is why I willingly remain among the spaceborn as an ambassador. The satellites were of a completely different nature. As much as I could learn from Grandfather's unreliable stories, those ships were the ships of dynamic change, or as one might also see them, the spacefaring labs, 
primarily designed for physiological and psychological experimentation. However, you shouldn't fear the satellites, Bobo. Only the first calls of Earth were brought there, and they represent the price paid for what the likes of you would be able to enjoy once you joined the convoy. Prodding and dissecting should not be an eventuality of your future, for the change that would come to those that would board the vessel now would be much less painful, though still very dramatic. The experiences of the first calls should be to you as grandfather's experiences are to me. However, I, myself, will remain a being in between, since my mind cannot be, by all means, complete. For if I am able to remain capable of communication and of humanity, I shall not be fully integrated into the body of the extraterrestrials. Unlike those of you that are yet to board, once my purpose has been fulfilled, I shall be left to continue changing until I resemble nothing capable of speech. This is when I shall be replaced. In the fifth year of my current life, as I stepped on the ground I walk on, I first began to notice these changes within me. Subtle, at first. But as time went on, and as I was more integrated with the lives of the spaceborne in the ship, the changes began to show all the more. If I were to come back to the Earth and gaze into your eyes, in this instant, you would not know it as your big sister standing before you, but another, holy other. <sighs> this is the gift that I had to receive upon ascending, and the gift that was withheld from Grandfather. Each step might be a step upward, however, it is also a leap into darkness. The details of the step are gruesome and entail much suffering, especially for human sensibilities. But I assure you, my dear brother, once it is taken, there is no more need for the same sentiment. The extraterrestrials that live out their lives on the satellite ships are far different from the spaceborn. I am convinced that most of them had never been allowed passage on the main ship, simply because they had once been creatures that had lived full lives upon other planets. Yes, Bobo, there is other intelligent life in the universe, apart from our godlike visitors. Or, should I say, there was much more of it, before they had stumbled upon it during their long journey. It took me quite some time to understand this, even though Grandfather had told me much about it ever since I had arrived on the ship. The spaceborn had become so accustomed to the genetic changes added to their own form, the many life forms they had assimilated, that they do not even see those as life forms, separated from themselves. If the extraterrestrials that left their homeworld some 35 million years ago were once one race, what they have become over time, through the mastery of genetic engineering and artificially induced evolution, is a container of the many codes of life. This should also account for their hideous appearance, the appearance that at first terrified and disgusted me beyond measure, has now become the only representation of beauty in this vast and cold universe. To be in the company of a spaceborn is to be in the company not of a monster, but that of a work of art. Each of them is a unique and complex masterpiece, where each stroke of the brush is taken from the endless genetic pool gathered along the way. Some of them may have tentacles, others no appendages at all, and some even walk on two feet. None, though is the same as the other. Yet, they are all still one, with one language, and with a structured society. Has this spelled out the idea of how they were able to survive for so long, Bobo? Can you now imagine humanity surviving, together with them? The current structure of the human flesh and consciousness 
are merely limitations to existing in the universe. Within the convoy, we would be forever. Or until there are no more living things left to cull. For one must wonder what fuels the perpetual life of the extraterrestrials. They do not procreate and feed by natural means. For their entire existence derives from the artifice of mixing and matching those properties of the living that they find useful, or sometimes simply interesting. Fortunately, the byproduct of their way of being is in the conservation of the make and properties of the ones they assimilate, in one way or another. While I would agree that there is a kind of brutality in that way of being, the argument would come from the side of me that still conforms to some kind of human nature. I have already seen and experienced so many things on this vessel that seeing life in the way I had seen it before seems like a step backwards. These extraterrestrials were once like us, I must believe. As proof, I shall mention simply the many iterations of civilized society that they had shifted through over the millions of years spent in the vacuum of space, surrounded by only themselves. They are not too keen on keeping historical records, ever since a malfunction caused their ship to wipe all of the accounts they once had of their homeworld and of their journey up to that point. As little of it that some of them remember, that was a time of darkness and uncertainty, where all of their worst characteristics surfaced as they wandered aimlessly. Others of the spaceborn interpret the malfunction as the moment they became what they are now, as if the slate was wiped clean, and they were able to truly introduce their new ideas into their old ways. It is telling that those who speak of the time with reverence are the ones who have noted it as an important historical moment in their becoming. It is also a question of how the brutality of the survival in those moments that caused the malfunction had further influenced who they are now. Imagine being on this spaceship some 20 million years ago. This was about the time of the Great Darkness. As sustainable as they had made their vassal, it took one small snack to render it incapable of being a home. I might never know exactly what happened, but I can guess. Little was left of their race after that incident. And it's a question of how much of the original ship was left as well. Whatever the extraterrestrials from 35 million light years away had done to survive, it sure wasn't civilized before the gods that they are now. They must have been vile and pathetic little creatures to endure the cold, empty void of space. This is a true testament to the power of change and their current iteration as a species. One can only pray they remain as loving and as soft as they are at the moment, for if they are again to fall from grace, no one can help us, or anyone or anyone else in the universe. It is better to become a property of their fashion than to be an enemy of their existence. All the suffering endured once the changes have been initiated will be, must be, justified once the integration is complete. This is why I would rather choose total assimilation over total and unambiguous annihilation. I am now in what is to be my tenth year on board. Grandfather had died a few years back, and his body was left to mummify in one of the endless halls of the ground I walk on. Almost perfectly preserved. He is the one, and only, monument of death on this eternal vessel. For the spaceborn, he might as well be a piece of lint, for they do not even perceive what is left of him. For me, his corpse is the one and only proof that I, too, was once human. The changes that I am going through have slowed down until a replacement is found, or at least until the rest of you yield under the conditioning done to you on the surface of Earth, and the last culling had been concluded. I wish I could say that I miss 
what once made my own flesh and blood. Eyes, arms, even hair. I wish that I missed being able to walk, instead of slithering on the icy metal flooring like a slug, leaving behind me a trail of what is left from the body of a human woman. I am grateful to still have my mind and my voice so that I can record what it is like to be part of this historic moment of cosmic connection. Don't be afraid when you, at last, are standing face to face with one of these beings, though they might not resemble anything you had known as extant on our planet, or look like everything that was ever there all at once. They do not mean you harm. To remind you, they don't even know what harm means. In the centuries past, they have already incorporated the characteristics of various animals from Earth, and they particularly like different kinds of bones and other calcified tissue. You may see rows of teeth and gaping mouths that never consume anything. You may notice growths that resemble horns or antlers, but they are of no purpose. You may witness whales that can walk on spider legs or spider bodies mounted on wings. In the past decade, the fashion of having eyes has become increasingly popular on the main ship. And for those purposes, they have even mounted new lights around the vessel so that the spaceborne can now be seen as some of Earth's animals do, can perceive the riches of the ground I walk on and gaze upon each other's endlessly varying faces. If only I could myself see their expressions. Do not be horrified, Bobo. Accept it, for it is in your future, and in the future of everyone you know or ever cared for in your human life. You must also understand that the current conditions on Earth are merely the device for making humanity meeker and more malleable for the dynamic change that is to be completed upon your ascension in the convoy. The creatures on the satellite ships are still working through the process of assimilation, but once they can be fully merged into the high society of those that populate the ground I walk on, they too will become spaceborn eventually. What the extraterrestrials have learned from me, and the rest that have already been taken, they have already introduced back to Earth as a preparatory step for your eventual integration, in body as well as in mind. See not your current predicament as slavery, but as the much needed indoctrination into higher order thinking and doing. Our cosmic visitors are teachers, far more than they are masters. As a teacher yourself, I'm sure you are aware of the level of authority and dominance that must be asserted to the younglings to make them behave and accept the rules of integration into adult society. This is what has been done to me, and you, and to all. Once humanity has joined them, they shall no longer be alien to us, nor are we to them. There shall only be one in as many iterations as you can imagine. Lastly, Bobo, my dearest little brother, I hope that you too can see Grandfather and me as we see ourselves. Remember us not as collaborators, I beg of you, but think of us as the guardians of humanity that would make sure our cosmic legacy survives so that humanity becomes part of the cosmic catalog that the extraterrestrials had been, are, and will continue collecting within their own growing body. I love you, Bobo. I wish you could still love me too. Do not fight, accept, and persevere. What you just heard was the first and last recorded letter that my sister Anna had sent me over a decade ago. She was the only one, apart from mother, to ever call me Bobo. However, she lost that right the minute she decided to board one of those vessels and aid the invader. I no longer care about her fate, and whatever she has become is of little importance to me. Damn be those that accepted another fate, and pity on those that were taken before they could make their choice. If I remember Anna, 
I will only do so with scorn. She was not a champion of humanity, but became a champion of the invader that would rather see us as accessories than as conscious beings. The few of us left might not have much need for understanding of the wretched beings that have reigned terror on our home for the past half millennia, but there is something to be learned from this message. There is indeed something of magnanimous importance that we have to learn to accept and that should propel us forward instead of pushing us further into darkness. Nothing more human remains on this planet than the ones of us that are here. There never will be anyone like me or you or Joe and Jane. We are the last, the only. And for that fact alone, we must hide to survive so that this enormous universe has account of us that we shall tell ourselves by living as ourselves. While we might not know what awaits us on the surface if we ever leave our sheltered home underground, and we do not know how many lives the last culling will take. What we do know is that here we are what we have always been, human. No more and no less. Should we perish here, we would have perished as we were born, below the ground that we once walked on as earthlings. Council Chamber, Elders of Padav. Never! No one is setting foot on that death trap again! One of the Elders said. It has been 800 years. Hax didn't pick up any signal from the Earth. Are you sure of what you are saying, Broding Aris? Another Elder added. Mighty Elders of Padav. I'm sorry if by any means my request caused any form of anger. Forgive me, I pleaded. I knew the Elders were hiding something from the people about the Earth. The only story that was told was how the Earth was uninhabitable and they had to leave. I always wondered what happened to the others who were not so lucky to leave Earth. My father would always tell me that a shepherd never left the Earth because one sheep was dumber than another. Narish, you are one of the best soldiers we have. Don't make us regret our choice, Raoon, the head of the elders, said. A doorway portal opened up in the chamber where the meeting was held. All nine elders stood and bowed their heads. I followed suit. It was the presence of Dell that caused their reactions. Dell was the man who had built the ship the privileged used to journey to the planet now called Padav, with the aid of a wormhole created by Dell himself. Everyone feared him greatly and also respected him. People called him the Timeless Man because he never aged a bit. Stand, and everyone stood. I heard about someone planning on going to the Earth, Del said in a tired tone. Yes, Del. It is I, Narish. Narish? Del asked curiously. I knew your father. He was an unusual man. What's the urgency of this meeting? My team got a distress signal from Earth, and I came to seek permission to have a look with my team. Interesting. And what do the Elders of Padav have to say about this? We rejected the request of young Narish, Lord Del, Ryun replied. He has my permission to go on this quest with his teammates and report whatever he finds directly to you, Del said. Agreed, Lord, Lord Del. 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 They were about to give me a formal authorization when Del took out one of his rings and gave it to me. I was stunned. As was the whole council. Such a thing had never happened before. I would love to see you come back, boy, Del said, with no expression on his face. Sounded like a threat to me. 
but I couldn't tell. Another doorway portal opened. He walked into it and disappeared. I couldn't understand what Dell meant, but the ring I was given was quite powerful because it could open a doorway portal anywhere and possessed great capability for chaos. The elders of Padav were dazzled by the way Dell spoke to me. Dell was seen as a god. He placed the elders to control Padav, our home after leaving the Earth 800 years ago. Nobody knew anything about Lord Dell, not even where he would be from one moment to the next. The only person who had much knowledge of Dell was the man himself. And the creepiest thing is, he'd been around since the first settlers of this planet. The elders didn't look like they agreed with the order Dell had just given, but they had no choice but to yield. Narish, you know you are making a mistake, right? And if anything goes wrong, you will be held accountable for it, one of the three elders said. I smirked and turned to leave the room. Your blood will be on your hands! Ryun shrieked from behind me as I walked out of the council chamber without saying another word. Outside, Pam waited, pacing the hallway lost in her own thoughts. Did they approve the mission, sir? She asked gingerly. We've been granted permission. After 800 friggin' years! Finally! Pam said through clenched teeth. We both knew this was different. The Earth hadn't been walked upon by humans for 800 years, or so they said. Yet deep down I knew there was something there. I walked into my office and sat with a big sigh. Pam had known me long enough to know that I was not feeling quite jolly. You want to talk about it? Pam said as she walked into my office. Pam, I spoke to Dell. Are you pulling my leg? What did he say to you? She was shocked. He hopes to see us come back. Are we even meant to go on this journey? Dell's statement had puzzled a lot. Don't tell me you're having doubts after pushing this far. Do you think we'll make it? I exhaled. Your guess is as good as mine, she said with a smile. I always found comfort in the presence of Pam. She was more than a friend to me, even though the station wasn't in support of intimacy among fellow agents. But if I could select a soulmate for eternity, it would definitely be Pam. Let's go meet the team. Roger that, sir. Pam and I made our way to Section X, where the team was stationed. Padav is dying. Heard that the oxygen we have won't take us long, a euphonic voice said as we drew closer. They noticed our presence and they all stood up, giving their salutes. Who told you that, Sergeant? I questioned. I was testing my new design that's able to breach strong firewalls to get information and control. Wiley Smith, our tech guy, answered. The only place with such a power wall is the council room, so I decided to try it there and I overheard this. They can't find out. They must not know. We stood in silence as Pam and I pondered what it could mean. Wiley Smith, Dan Dave, Sarah Lars and Ray Ryan. You guys get ready. We leave in an hour. Whatever the council had in mind, I wasn't sticking around to find out. Yes, sir, they answered in unison. Hey, Wiley, stay back, would you? I need you here. Roger that, sir. Wiley, thank you for your time. Don't tell anyone about this. I was slowly getting confused about what was going on. I needed answers to the puzzling questions that burdened me. I had always known the elders to do the right thing for the planet. Maybe I was wrong all along. I walked back to my office, pondering on what Wiley had just said to the team. I stared at the ring Dell gave me. It was said to be powerful enough to open a wormhole at any time by thought and also summoned antimatter energy. I held the ring towards the wall as I summoned a wormhole leading to port site, a place on Padav where waste and garbage go for recycling. I was astonished by the power of the ring when I stormed out to show Pam how the ring worked. I dashed into her and Wiley chatting. 
I wondered what they were talking about. What's going on? I asked. Wiley and I were thinking of going to check the oxygen level of the planet, just to be sure we're not getting wrong news, Pam said. No, I don't approve of this, I replied. Aren't you even a little bit curious about everything going on right now? The elders are keeping something away from us, and we want to know what it is. Aren't you even a little bit curious about everything going on right now? The elders are keeping something away from us, and we want to know what it is. I stared at them. Wiley was the tech head of the squad, and I trusted his guts most of the time. The guy was a bloodhound when it came to things like this. The planet control station is not guarded by humans. I hope you know that. And if you get caught, it'll cause a big shit show for all of us, I said. Don't worry about us getting caught. We have that covered. Been working on a program that I think can hack into the guard robot system. Wiley was tenacious in his creed. You can go, but remember that I didn't approve of this. And I really wish you guys weren't so stubborn half the time. Council Chamber I had been summoned again to the council room. I hoped I wasn't in trouble for letting Pam and Wiley go for recon. The atmosphere of the council chamber had a strange aura around it. I felt like Pam and Wiley had been caught, but I had to hold myself together. Greetings, elders. We will need you and your team to leave immediately for the mission. You have our full permission, Rayun said, but I told my team tomorrow. You leave immediately, soldier, and that's final. I understand, my elders. I bowed, not wanting to argue with them. You're dismissed, boy, one of the elders said. I felt something was wrong. I hadn't heard anything from Pam and Wiley concerning their survey on the planet control station for over an hour now. Something didn't seem right. Sector X, Command Section. I dashed into the section where the team was awaiting my command. All the soldiers who saw me saluted. I nodded and moved to where my team was. Where's Wiley? I asked, heart beating. We put out a search team for them. They seem to have gone off our radar. Oh shit, I said point blankly. Get Ryan and Dan. We leave now. Sir, what happened to them? Pam and Wiley. Hope to God we come back alive to find out. By the way, we're taking this big boy with us, I said, pointing to the hacks. I didn't know what to think at that moment. I was perplexed. Maybe they were caught... But if they were caught, the elders would have placed a penalty on them already. Something didn't sit right. I had to tell the elders of this incident, even though I suspect that they had something to do with it strongly. You guys prepare yourself for the journey. I'll be back, I said. I knew they had something to do with Wiley and Pam's absence, but I had to seek their help, even if they had handed it. I stepped into the council chamber, and deep down I felt like pulling out their heads, but immediately I entered. I went on my knees. Young man, you've been in the council chamber three consecutive times already. What the bloody hell do you want? One of the elders asked. Great one. Two of my teammates were reported missing from duty just this evening. Search droids have gone around, but there's no sign of them, I said. Young man, do we look like we are all-knowing? The case of your teammates isn't one we will consider now. We advise you to take the hacks we'll provide you and your remaining teammates for the mission before we change our minds, Rayun said. I was scared for the first time in a long time. I didn't want to lose my partners. I fell on my face before them. Please! I need them for this mission, I pleaded. They looked so calm about the whole situation. I knew something was off. Hacks 544, escort Mr. Narish out of our presence and make sure that mission is taken care of properly, Ryun said. And young man, you have proven to us that you are unworthy of the post we've assigned to you. It'll be a wonder if you make it back alive. 
I pondered on Ryun's last words as the hacks escorted me out. What happened, sir? Why do you have a hacks following you? Ray asked once he set eyes on me. Guys, I don't think Pam and Wiley will be joining us. We're taking a hacks instead. The whole team was in shock as they prepared. They wondered what was happening, but they had no choice but to obey. They all wore their special spacesuits and prepped themselves for our departure. We were using the wormhole in Sector X, highly prohibited, with a death penalty attached to it if broken. Just as I was about to start the sequence for the wormhole, I noticed the ring Dell had given me was missing. I was shocked, but this wasn't the time for any distractions. I punched in the secure pass and waited as the circle-shaped portal door churned to life. This is the first time we'll be setting foot on Earth in 800 years. After we jump, you might experience extreme weakness, but just hold on. It gets even more fucked up, I said as we walked through. Earth. Guys, status report, I yelled as I recovered from the jump. Check, Ray confirmed. Check. Dan confirmed slowly, still recovering. I'm fine, Sarah said, patting her body around just to be sure she was all in one piece. We all felt weak, but looking around I could see the presence of trees and even hear birds chirping. I was shocked to my bones. Thought they said the sun burned out. I saw it myself. Or was that what we were led to believe? Strength was pumped into my body as I sprung up to see more while the others recovered. We didn't get to see much of nature on Padav, so we were dazzled by what we found. Yet the Earth did not look like what I expected it to. I expected the planet to be covered in ice. Destroyed. Hacks, scan the area, see whether you can find anything, I said to our assigned sentient AI. Hacks took the command and began scanning. The others had recovered from the effect of the jump and joined me in wonder of the new discovery. We didn't have birds on Padav. We barely even had an ecosystem. Unidentified threat within close proximity. Permission to terminate. The hacks alerted in its automated tones. The team was confused but alert. There wasn't anything threatening around as far as the eye could see. Threat about to make strong impact. Permission to terminate. The Hacks said again, with more urgency. Stand down, Hacks. There's nothing here. For a split second, the whole atmosphere was quiet. Something felt wrong. Hacks, eliminate close threats immediately, I ordered, my eyes darting around for anything out of the ordinary. The team was down in terror as a creature came out of its camouflage and grabbed Ray by the leg. The Hacks immediately reached the creature with unreal speed as it decimated the being. The terror was heavy on the team, and they had the look of curiosity on them. They wanted to know more about what they had just encountered. Hacks, what is that? I asked. The creature is called a Yara. What the fuck is a Yara? Dan asked. The Yaras were the original habitants of Padav, before Dell made a deal with them which cost us our planet. Hacks said. Wait, 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 wait. What do you mean, made a deal? My mind was reeling with questions. The sun was way beyond its half-life and was coming to an end. Dell promised the Yaras immense energy from the Earth's core in exchange for their technology. But he couldn't deliver on such a promise, and the Yaras took from the sun itself, draining what was left of it. In the end, the Yaras made a trade. Padav for Earth, and Dell took it. And you know all this how? I asked. You're really going to believe this thing? Sarah looked at me as if I was out of my mind. The elders have been hiding something. Even the elders before them. The Ciara looks like a small, like a child, which means something bigger lurks around. Threat approaching us in about 20 seconds, Hacks replied. What is happening, Hacks? Speak to me, I screamed. Threat level extreme. Permission to exterminate? The Hacks questioned. Permission granted! The ground began to tremble as another creature dashed out of its hiding and burst into a sprint for me. Activate suspension glob, the hack said calmly. Immediately, everything within close proximity froze, even the creature. But this particular looking creature was bigger than the other we'd encountered, and more gruesome looking. 
The hacks moved towards the Yara that was suspended in the air. It took out a blade and stabbed through the crown multiple times. Deactivate suspension, Glob. It said. Everything frozen within a 40-yard radius normalized, and the Yara dropped dead. The team was shocked as to what the hacks had just done. What did you just do, hacks? I questioned. I attended to your request, Commander. The hacks answered. I know that. How do you know its weak point? Extreme threats approaching in 60 seconds. The hacks cut in. We knew there wasn't time to chat. We started moving. Would you mind scanning parameter for any energy supply source, Hacks? I asked. Scanning now. The Hacks answered. Ray and Sarah, see if you can get eyes in the air. They both reached into their kit bags, pulled out a little pod, and threw it in the air. The pod deployed as it went high as a drone. Dan, we'll need you to communicate to the station to report our state. I'm afraid I cannot let you carry on with that order, sir. The Hacks said. I'm sorry? What do you mean? I replied. The elders commanded that everything be reported to death, not to any other authority. So I'm afraid I will have to block your signal until the elders deem it fit for me not to. The hack said calmly. I knew they had the power to bend matter and recreate matter. Nobody knew anything of why and how they were created, but they were extremely powerful. To fight it would mean death. We kept moving. The hacks had picked up an energy supply source nearby in a mountain. My eyes in the air. What are you picking up? I asked. I spot a herd of the Yara's distance from where we are now, and it seems like they're feeding on something, Ray said. Zoom in and find out what they're feeding on, I commanded. Seems like they're feeding on the Earth, Sarah said in a confused tone as she looked again to confirm what she had just seen. Hacks, I think it's about time you started talking. What are the Yaras really doing here, and how do you know so much about them? I asked vehemently. The Hacks wasn't allowed to speak about anything outside what the Elders had commanded it to say. We waited in anticipation for an answer, but there was no response from the Hacks. There. I see the mountain which the energy is pulsating from. The Hacks said as it broke the silence. We drew near to the mountain as we noticed a cave which had a lot of Yaras flocking in and out. There was something about the set of Yaras that flocked into the cave. They glowed blue as if they were carrying something into the cave. Hax, I'll need you to have a closer look at the cave and report here, I commanded. Copy that, sir, the Hax said as it launched into the sky. I need answers, and I was sure everyone on the team did too. Could that be the source of the signal we received back on Padav? We knew the Elders and even Del himself were hiding something. And we knew the hacks had answers, but we had to come up with a way to get it to talk. We need to get the hacks to talk before we get in something we don't understand. It's obviously hiding something, Sarah said. Yes, but how do we get it to talk? I mean, it's not like we can force it or anything, Ray added. I think I know of a way. Wiley was working on a chip that would break through any program or wall to get information. He gave one of it to me. I think we can use it. Sarah said. Let's hope it works. We just have to find a way to place it on the hacks, I said. Now that won't be a problem, Sarah said. The hacks had just returned. Seems like the Yaras are storing the energy that they are harvesting from the Earth's core and saving it in that cave. They might be powering something, the hacks said. So, what do you think? I asked. I think whatever they are doing should be stopped. That is why I have already communicated with the Council, and they are calling the mission off, because it's beyond your level now. The Hacks added. I beg your pardon? This is my mission, I get to call the shots, I said, letting my voice go wild a bit. Commander, I'm asking nicely for you and your crew to leave. We will handle this. The Hacks added. Sarah, now! Ray screamed as she placed the chip on the Hacks' artificial skin. She had been standing behind it the whole time. It immediately powered down. We gathered round to see what had happened. It began to reboot. The chip had wiped out the encryptions the elders had placed in it. I knew it could speak without restrictions now. What do you know about these creatures, Hax? I questioned. They were the original inhabitants of Padav. Did the sun really burn out? This question would change everything. No. Hax said. But 
The Padabs wanted humans gone all along, and so they tampered with the sun's core a bit. What do you mean they tampered with the sun's core? Sarah was nearly hysterical at this moment. The thought of living a lie all along. All I can say is that they had the technology for it. Axe replied. So how do we stop them? How do we take back our home? I'm afraid I can't let you leave this place. You know too much already. There was silence as the pods in the air picked up alarming signals as the herd of Yara stormed out moving in our direction. We'd been spotted. What can we do, Hax? I yelled. Unless there's a way to break open the power supply they are draining from the earth. Also, have this. The Hax said as he handed him the ring Dell gave him. Why? Why help us? You said we couldn't leave, so why help us? I asked repeatedly. The elders didn't want you to have it. It might come in handy. I'm afraid my encryptions are being placed back by the elders. The Hax said as it shut down. Guys, gather around. I screamed. As we gathered around, I used the ring to open up a portal to get to the cave. We stepped into it as the Yaras raged towards us. Immediately we appeared. All our gadgets powered down. You made it. Too bad you won't make it back, a euphonic voice said from behind us. It was Del, and he seemed to shift back and forth from human to Yara. At this point, he wasn't as great and powerful as we saw him on Padav anymore. This is the future. If you can't do anything, everyone on Padav will die. Humanity will be obsolete, Del said, as the Yaras around the cave launched at us. They had lost all hope of what to do. There wasn't any way they could survive or even help the people. Our whole life on Padav was a lie. The Yaras were tearing them limb from limb, and I was next. I had only one trick up my sleeve, or rather, my already bleeding arm, but it would kill us all. I could use the ring to create just one drop of antimatter this close to so much energy I could obliterate the whole Earth. Well, nice knowing you, Del! I shrieked as I pulled the cap off the ring, a move Del wasn't expecting. One. Two. Three. Everything seemed to freeze as if nothing had happened. Then an ear-splitting roar wiped everything into oblivion, closing my eyes forever. And all the truth we learned. Her eyes popped open. The dreams had returned. The accident. She blamed herself for his death. She was in front of the steering wheel that day. Thoughts of her husband's lifeless body plagued her consciousness. Her dress, stained with blood as she held him in her arms, waiting for an ambulance. He was still breathing, but his chances were slim. It is said that nothing ever truly dies, just a transition into another world. She often tried to comfort herself with thoughts of the good memories they had, but it never really lasted. He was gone. Annabelle watched as the wavy lines on the electrodiagram device thinned out into one straight line and the loud beep that followed. She didn't need to be told what had happened. He was dead. She sobbed quietly as her thoughts trailed back to the sad event. Her alarm clock began to ring out. It was time for work. Annabelle forced herself out of bed and into the shower. She was a nurse at the town hospital and she needed to get to work on time. No negative thoughts, she whispered to herself. She munched on some leftover food before storming out of the house with Junior. The rising sun cast a rosy hue across the morning sky. Golden fingers of sunlight lit up the scene across the blue sky, dotted with fluffy white clouds that drifted lazily in the gentle breeze. The new day came with a renewed sense of hope and freshness, and she filled her lungs with enough air. 
She watched as a black cat chased a tiny white mouse into its hole in the distance. <laughs> oh, deja vu. She chuckled before strolling toward the bus stop. Exxon 51 paced around on the Space Mission Center on Mars. He had been having weird nightmares from his past. Who is Annabelle? He mused. He felt a deep connection with her. He stared at his body of parts. A part of him had been entirely replaced with machines, and even his heart was controlled by a working program. He noticed that he was completely human in his dreams. What happened to him? He took a quick glance around the hub. The entire place was filled with hundreds of cyborgs just like him, carrying out their various commands without question. He wasn't meant to be having dreams or emotions. Something was wrong. He knew the planet which had appeared in his dreams. He had been there twice on a delivery mission. Did he perhaps have a life on Earth before this one? He wondered, but most importantly, he wanted to find out who Annabelle was. Sir, I've noticed a strange anomaly with Exxon 51. He seems to be gaining memories from his past. One of the scientists declared. Bring him in for examination. Find out why this is happening and reset his memory afterward. Blake replied. Blake was the man in charge of the secret government-funded Exxon project. They have advanced technology which detected individuals with potential cybernetic properties in the world, and after their deaths, they retrieved their bodies, converting them into cyborgs and sending them through portals to Mars to enhance the colonization of the Red Earth planet. I'm sorry, ma'am, your husband didn't make it, the doctor had told her. She tried to be strong for her unborn son. Benjamin never got to see his son. She had walked in to see his body before strolling out of the hospital in tears. In the distance, the doctor could be seen speaking with a blonde man in a black tuxedo. They had come for Benjamin. The scent of disinfectant hovered in the air as Annabelle strolled into the hospital. Good morning, Anna, the registrar smiled. Morning, babe, she replied. How's Junior doing? Oh, naughty as always, <laughs> she chuckled. She never really got over her husband's death, and everyone had noticed. They tried to help her get back to her feet. They were a new couple, and she was already pregnant when the accident happened. Those were one of her darkest days. It had just been a few weeks after the wedding, and she had just learned about her condition. She was planning on telling Benjamin when the crash happened. She had driven off the highway and into a nearby ditch beside the road. Her husband was still breathing when he was pulled out of the wreck, and they were both soon rushed to the nearby emergency clinic where she worked. Her colleagues were shocked to see Annabelle and her husband on a stretcher. They helped out in every possible way, but Benjamin died later that evening. I have to find Annabelle. Those were the words that escaped his lips as he woke up from his night rest. Sir, Exxon 51 just breached sleep command. He is acting fully on his own will now. Shut him down! Now! Blake groaned. Sir, we've lost control over his program. But that's not possible. He should be dead without our control markers. Blake barked. Sir, I think you should see this. Exxon 51 was racing at incredible speeds toward the transportation portal hub. Awaken the cyborgs. He must not leave that planet. Hundreds of cyborgs. Their eyes shot open in unison with only one command. Stop Exxon 51 from accessing the portal, and if proving difficult, terminate. A female robotic voice emanated from the portal control system. Destination, she inquired. Exxon 51 replied instantly. Destination, Earth. Command accepted. Opening destination for travel. 
Enjoy the jump! The robotic voice sounded again. Just then, hundreds of cyborgs trooped into the transportation portal hub. But they wished they had come earlier. Exxon 51 was gone. Sir, he's gone. Blake smashed his tablet against the ground in anger. Where is his landing spot? I... I am not sure, sir. If you don't find Exxon 51 in 24 hours, you can say goodbye to your family. Blake threatened and sped out of the room as the scientist swallowed hard. (laughs) The barks from dogs in the distance were growing with each moment, as though they could sense something in the distance. Someone was stalking her. She had just ended her night shift and was making her way to the bus station. Her heart raced as she hastened her steps. She had dropped off Junior earlier in the day, but she now felt a strange fear for him too. She turned around and spotted a hooded man behind her. It was already the late hours of the night and the road was almost deserted. She attempted to run, but bumped into someone and crashed to the ground. Was he wearing some sort of metallic armor? She thought. Annabelle, it's me. Those few words sent cold shivers down her spine. She would recognize that voice anywhere. Her heart began to pound harder. Who, who, who are you? She asked. The strange man proceeded to remove his hood. She stared at the face of the person who stood before her. He looked bit different, but she couldn't be mistaken. I remember what happened, Annie, he said. I remember all of it. No, no, you're dead. Help! Someone help me! She screamed. Annie, Annie, come on, I can explain. She didn't want any explanation. She believed that she was seeing a ghost. His face was damaged. He looked like some sort of machine. Get away from me! She stood up and scurried away from him. She couldn't deny the whispers in her heart, which told her that it was Ben. You always said you loved the stars. I grew to love them too. Annabelle stopped. She hesitantly joined him. It's It's funny funny how how they they seem seem to shine shine a little little brighter brighter now now that that you have joined joined them. them. They both recited the short lines. But, Ben, is that you? She turned. That was the line he had recited to her on their wedding day. I can explain. He replied. She rushed towards Ben and embraced him. Annabelle decided to ditch the bus and take a stroll home with Benjamin. Her house was just a few blocks away. I see you moved out, Ben said. The house had too many memories of you. I couldn't stay there. I'm so sorry, Annabelle, my love. I didn't mean to leave you. What happened to you? She said, staring at his body, a mix of man and machine. I died, yes. There's a secret organization that experiments on cadavers, creating cyborgs out of them and sending them to distant planets for study and colonization. I was one of them. When we are awoken, we didn't have any memories of our past lives, and we only follow the orders that we are given. I was sent to Mars. Mars? Annabelle looked perplexed. How did you remember then? I... I don't know. I started having dreams. I began to feel. Cyborgs are not meant to do that, and recently, my memories returned. I remembered you, and I decided to find you. I just wanted to see you again. I left without saying goodbye, but I'm afraid I'll be unable to stay back. Why? What are you talking about? Please, please, don't, don't, don't leave me again, Ben. Annabelle, I'll be endangering you by hanging around. The Exxon Corporation should be searching for me right now. I had to cloud our location from them. If not, they would have found us. Besides, look at me. Annie, I've become a monster. 
I can't give you the life I promised. I'm so sorry. I've always loved you, even in death. Annabelle burst into tears as she listened to Ben. Ben drew closer and gave her a warm hug. Oh, I am. Um, I always wanted uh, Junior to meet his father. Junior? Benjamin gasped. My son? You... Benjamin was still speaking when Annabelle's phone rang out. A familiar voice echoed through the speakers. If you want your son alive, do not attempt to fight. Those were the only words that were heard, followed by Junior's scared cries. Sir, I've secured the location of x 51 Benjamin could hear their conversation, and he listened in. Permanent. It was Blake's voice. What about the woman, sir? Blake replied. That was all Ben needed to hear. He grabbed Annabelle and took off. He hacked into a nearby car, jumped in, and drove into the nearby highway. Several cars raced after them, giving birth to a heated road chase. Well, what are you doing? Annabelle cried out. Her son is in danger. Don't worry about him. I made a stop before I came here. I got back up. In an abandoned cabin in the outskirts of the city, a masked figure was crouched in the darkness, waiting for the right time to strike. She could spot Benjamin's son sitting in the middle of three hefty men. This was going to be easy, she thought, as she tightened her grip around her gun and strolled in. Hello, boys, she said, as they stared at her in shock. Ben raced past several cars as several bullets shattered the car screen into pieces as they approached a bridge. Oh, Jesus! Annabelle exclaimed, but Ben was unmoved. The heavy gunfire was relentless, and the car groaned and screeched as he meandered his way through dozens of cars that also raced along the bridge. One of the bullets found its way into the fuel tank. Ben noticed. He had superhuman abilities. He instantly grabbed Annabelle, hugging her and creating a metallic shield wall around the both of them, tearing his way out of the car as it burst into flames. He jumped from the bridge into the river below as the cars came to a stop around the crash. But they were gone. Wh what are we going to do now? Annabelle asked as Junior played with Ben's metallic face. Junior was just four, and he looked a lot like his father. They had met in a secret location. I'll return to the Exxon facility. I caused all this mess. I shouldn't have brought you all into this. Ben said. I don't think that'll stop them from coming after your wife and son. I try to pull a few strings to make sure that Blake does not harm your family, the masked woman said. She turned to Ben with a reassuring look, took one nod at him before disappearing into the night. Annabelle knew that the moments she had with Ben will not be for long. For the second time, anyway, he was going to die. Several government agencies were aware of the Exxon project, and the government provided one of their major funding. Annabelle guessed that the masked woman was a high-ranking individual in the country. The days were speeding fast. Annabelle had been waiting for a phone call. She couldn't go to work, and Junior couldn't go to school either. She wasn't bothered anyway. She was glad to be with Ben for as long as it lasted. They soon got lost in deep conversation as they reminisced on past times. The call soon came in. It was Blake. Exxon 51, you may report to the facility with your wife and son. All eyes fell on Benjamin as he strolled into the secret facility with Annabelle and Junior. The workers knew about the Exxon project but they had never been allowed this close to any of the cyborgs. He spotted Blake standing in the distance with a team of scientists. Your memory would be formatted, and you will return to Mars and carry out your function. A new program has been designed, and the bug has been removed. Your wife will be safe as long as she works with us. She is a nurse, so that shouldn't be much of a problem. Your son is still too young, and so he is not a threat. It was a fair deal and Ben nodded in understanding. He shifted his gaze towards Annabelle, 
as he stared at her one last time. He wanted to know what it felt like to love one last time before dying for the second time. Goodbye, Annie, my love. Tears hugged her cheeks as she pondered on the recent events, but she had to let him go. He was leaving her for the second time in her life, but this time she found peace. She wrapped herself around his arms one last time before he strolled away from the room towards the portal transport room. Junior! Junior, where are you? Annabelle was much older now, and she couldn't run as she used to. Cyborgs were storming through the portal into the Exxon facility, and they took down anyone who attempted to engage with them. The cyborgs were running on a totally different program. Someone had hacked into the Exxon command box and had taken control of all the cyborgs and transported all of them to Earth. Junior had followed his mom to work, but had wandered off with a few of his friends. And even though the cyborgs were not harming civilians, Annabelle just wanted to get out of there. Junior had grown up to become a computer geek. Annabelle had not hidden the secret about his father from him, so somehow she knew that his father's circumstance was what had fueled his zeal to study computers. He was so good that at the age of 16, he was already working with Exxon for various projects. Mom! Junior's voice echoed despite the chaos. Annabelle rushed towards him and stole a warm embrace. She would never forgive herself if anything happened to Junior. He was all she had left. Come on, we need to go, Annabelle said quickly. Everyone was rushing out of the Exxon facility as the loud, blaring sirens could be heard in the distance. Annabelle had been working as a nurse at the Exxon facility for 15 years now, and she had seen a lot of crazy things, but definitely nothing this crazy. Several men bearing guns soon stormed into the Exxon facility, shooting towards the roof. Mom, let's go through the other exit, Junior said, pointing towards the incoming terrorists. At least they were not harming anyone. Yet, why do people need to create sideboards? She often thought. The dead were better left dead. Now these guys were probably here for the cyborgs to help them execute their evil plans. Maybe world domination? Who knows? The Exxon Project, in the hands of the wrong person, can be used to perpetrate terrible things. Just as Annabelle was about to dart out of the facility with her son, she was pulled into a dark corner as she immediately let out a dying scream. <laughs> Mom, Mom, it's okay, it's Dad! Junior proceeded to give his father a high five. The look on Annabelle's face was priceless. Her jaw dropped in shock. Junior was not even meant to know his father. How... How did Benjamin still have his memories? What the hell is going on? Several questions began to stroll across her mind as she stared in shock. Long story. We'll talk about that later. Benjamin said. They will come for Junior. They know what he is capable of. I need you guys to get somewhere safe. Junior will take you to William. He'll keep you guys away from harm. How long have you guys been speaking? Why didn't you tell me about any of this? Annabelle didn't know what next to say. She could hear her heart pound as confusion covered her face. We've been speaking for quite a while now. 
Benjamin gave Junior a small wink before letting out a small chuckle. Come on, you guys, you need to stop doing that, Annabelle said, punching Benjamin on the chest. Ouch! Oh. Annabelle groaned in pain. I think you forgot to part where I'm part machine, Benjamin joked. It's no wonder he knows so much about computers, Annabelle said. Nah, that wasn't me. He's the one who hacked into my system and replaced it with a double command mimic code, which means I can be both cyborg and human simultaneously. Freed you? What are you talking about? I need to go now. Whoever hacked Exxon Cyborgs wants something, and it's not going to be good. I need to continue to act in character until Junior can find a way out of all of this. I'm not the only mole amongst the cyborgs anyway. They'll most likely come for me, because I'm the obvious person who Junior would have most likely tried his code on, so they wouldn't suspect another. Mom, we need to go, Junior said, pulling his mom out of the facility as they both rushed into their car and sped out of the vicinity. As Annabelle sped along the highway, she tried to gather her thoughts and make sense of what had just happened. Who is William? she asked curiously. A friend, Junior replied almost instantly. Do you know what caused all this? And why didn't you tell me about all of this? Annabelle interrogated. Uh, someone stole the code I used to hack into Dad to get him back. Uh, that was how he was able to hack all the cyborgs. But besides, you would have said no, and I... I didn't want to get you worried. You should have told me anyway. Do you know what damage you might have just caused? Annabelle scolded. I, I just wanted to meet... Dad. I, I'm sorry, Mom. I'll, I'll, I'll fix this. Annabelle opened her mouth, but she found no words. Junior guided her as they drove into William's secret base. Junior rushed out of the car and into the house, followed closely by his mother. I've been waiting for you, William said calmly. Uh, nice to meet you, ma'am. Annabelle nodded to his response. She hoped that her boy was going to be safe. Your father's program has been shut down, but Exxon 74 is still online. They are carrying out a total sweep, so we have to be fast before they discover him, too. Junior began to work his way around the computer. It seemed like gibberish to Annabelle, but William seemed to have a clue about what was going on. It was fun to watch her son work, and... She knew that she was so proud of him. Hey, uh, Junior, the scan is almost complete, William let out anxiously. Who, who are these people? Annabelle asked. Oh, they're cyborg terrorists. They live and breathe in the dark web. When your son attempted to break your husband's coat a few years ago, <laughs> it seems as though someone else was eavesdropping. They developed a superior code over the years and decided to take over the Exxon cyborgs. I'm not quite certain about their motive, anyway. It could be world domination, money, or probably just the feel of power. <laughs> Who really knows why tyrants become tyrants? William replied. And how exactly do you guys plan to stop them in a few minutes? Annabelle asked curiously. Oh, oh, ma'am, trust me, your son is a genius. One minute left, Junior, William exclaimed, making Annabelle's heart skip a beat. Almost done, Junior said anxiously. Five, four, three, two, done! Junior jumped from his seat. If the cyber terrorist had succeeded in blocking out his only link into the cyborg, it would have taken him weeks to break the code. Yes! Junior let out with glee. I did it! I have shut down all the cyborgs. Thanks, Dad. He threw himself into the air in ecstasy. In the control room of the Exxon facility, 
They had just completed a scan of all the Exxon cyborgs. They had discovered that Exxon 51 had been compromised, and they instantly shut him down. They still needed him anyway. They might later want to know how to create a perfect merge of man and machine by themselves in the future, and Benjamin might prove useful. Sir, I think there's another one. He was still speaking when all the cyborgs began to shut down simultaneously. Security operatives had already surrounded the entire building, but they could not proceed because the cyborgs were standing guard over the facility. They didn't know that the cyborgs had been shut down yet. Contact West Wing. Tell them to locate the boy and secure him. Copy that, sir. I think we need to leave this place, William suggested. But where can we go? Annabelle asked with a worried look on her face. No, I have to free Dad first. He'll know what to do, and he could help take out the cyber guys from the inside, Junior said. He seemed to be enjoying what he was doing. That, that's a brilliant idea, William added. After a few minutes, Junior was done with the hack, and they now decided to go to the authorities for safety. William had a friend in the government, and they didn't have much of a choice. The trio hurried out of the house when William spotted several men bearing guns storming into his residence. Oh, we're too late, he declared. They're already here. Uh, I have a secret bunker below the house. Ju Junior knows where it is. Quick, you guys, you can go hide in there, William said. What about you? Junior asked curiously. Just go, Williams barked back. Junior and his mother hurried down into the bunker as William rushed out to meet the invaders. They all had masks on. Where's the boy? One of the men asked William. Boy? What boy? The leader of the crew cracked a shot into William's right leg as William let out a scream. I'll say this one last time. The man took a few steps towards William and pointed his gun at his head. You <laughs> William began to laugh hysterically. <laughs> you, you, can, you, 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 you can go fuck yourself. <laughs> William continued to laugh at the top of his lungs. Search the house. The man gave his order, and the men sprung into motion. He then shifted his gaze back to William. Wrong end. I'm right here. Junior emerged from the house with his mother. Get him! The man said and shifted his gun back towards William's head. A loud shot was heard. But it wasn't William who dropped to the ground. William stared at the lifeless body of his shooter in disgust. Take cover! He screamed as Junior and his mother scrambled to safety. Bullets flew around the entire place as several men trooped in. Blake was accompanied by several officials from the government intelligence. They had tracked them to the location. I figured you would need some help, Blake let out calmly. Sir, I just received information. They failed to secure the boy. The government got to him first. Round up the hostages. If they do not bring the boy here in the next hour, we will kill every single person in this place each minute. Benjamin watched in silence as everyone was being rounded up. He pretended to have shut down with the rest of the cyborgs. He needed to wait for the perfect time to make his move. I need another team out there on their tails right now, the leader of the cyber terrorists barked. Junior had become the most wanted person alive in just a few hours. The activities of Exxon were no longer a secret, and Blake would have a lot of questions to answer when all of this was over. They were already everywhere on the news. A road chase soon ensued as Blake meandered his way around the cars which were sped along the highway. Incoming! One of the men screamed. 
an incoming missile crashed into the car in front of Blake, making it somersault into the sky. Luckily, William, Annabelle, and Junior were seated in Blake's car. Blake quickly stepped on the brake as the tires gave a loud screech. Junior placed his hands over his head as the heated gunfire ensued. In the midst of the chaos, he placed a call to his father. Dad! Dad, help! Those were the only words he said. Benjamin sprung into motion immediately as he heard his son's voice. They had not expected the sudden turn of events. His son was in danger, and he needed to act fast. Benjamin took out every one of them in the blink of an eye. He then proceeded outside to alert the authorities about what had happened. The security operatives were perplexed at first. But when the hostages began to rush out of the facility, they had no choice but to go in. The heated gunfire was still ongoing when Benjamin descended on the road. Dad! Junior screamed as he sighted his father. Told you he was gonna get here before you're back up! <laughs> William said, still groaning in pain. Annabelle had been able to slow down the bleeding, but they needed to get him to the hospital, and they were now slowly running out of time. The terrorists intensified their fire when they saw him, and they begun to launch everything they had at him. Dad, use your new upgrade! Junior screamed. Annabelle had been watching the synergy between father and son ever since Benjamin arrived at the fight scene. She was glad Junior had gotten him back after all. Backup soon arrived and the terrorists were soon beaten down to zero. The others, noticing that the battle was already lost, surrendered. The gunfire ceased and Junior ran to embrace his father. Annabelle and Blake followed closely behind. They were grateful to him for his help. I think you should stay with your family from now, Blake said calmly. Everyone turned to look at him. What? They all chorused simultaneously. Well, everyone knows about Exxon Corp now, so there's no need for secrecy anymore. Besides, you've earned it, Blake said. Someone please get this young man to the hospital, Blake instructed while pointing at William. Annabelle had been staring at Benjamin for a while. Fifteen years had passed, but it, it felt like just a day. Yeah, you know, um, you know you have some explaining to do, Annabelle joked. How come you refuse to stay dead? Your memories were taken from you 15 years ago, so so how is it possible that, that you still remember everything? Benjamin heaved a heavy sigh before speaking. So, it turns out that I'm not really like the rest of the cyborgs. They didn't take my memories away from me 15 years ago. They decided that it would be better if there was a human cyborg on Mars but I was not allowed to make communication with any of you. It was difficult, but it was the only way I could keep the memories alive. Well, until Junior came sniffing around. I'm... I'm... I'm just glad you're okay. Annabelle let out quietly. The rest of the terrorists were rounded up and their faces exposed as a familiar woman strolled in. Annabelle would recognize her face anywhere. She gave a warm smile at her before strolling towards her and stealing a warm embrace. It had been an eventful day, and Annabelle was glad that it was all over. When I woke up that morning, the siren sounded. The siren itself wasn't the problem though. It was the number of blasts. Not one. To mark the beginning of the day's rigorous exercises, which every person was meant to be a part of, without exception. Not two. To mark the meals for each day, 
delivered to the buildings by automated robots at precise times with little packets of pills for each person. No other meals were allowed. Not even three. To signal the day's end, when every room in every building had their lights cut off automatically. This time, it was five. I couldn't believe my ears. There was only one possibility, I thought as I pushed the covers off in a full sprint towards the windows, and I felt my heart stop in surprise as I glimpsed the large, green and brown spotted vehicle in the middle of the street in front of my home. The siren sounded again. Five shrieking blasts that shattered the quiet of the pre-dawn and no doubt called the attention of every person in the town. I could feel my heart pump even faster, supplying me with the nervous energy as I pulled on the nearest items of clothing that I could reach. A simple white t-shirt and a pair of loose black pants, pulling my heavy brown curls into a ponytail. I rushed out of my room and into the living room, meeting the stares of my little family gathered around the coffee table as I slowed to a stop. My mother smiled, a little thing that raised the wrinkled corners of her lips, hope gleaming in her warm brown eyes, identical to mine, save for the ring of white starting to creep at the edges. My father stood by her, his broad shoulders straight and tense, and his pale blue eyes were shuttered, but I could sense that he was just as excited as she was, if not more. There were no words said, but I knew we couldn't be sure yet. Not until the siren blasted for the third time. Five more shrieking blasts that made me want to cover my ears and crouch until they passed. In the heavy silence that followed, there was a tiny click as the front door was unlocked. We stared at each other for the last time, a gleam of hope and wonder in my parents' eyes before we walked to the door together. They held my hands, and I held theirs, suddenly nervous. The most I had seen of the outside was through the windows, but never anything more, and I didn't know what to expect. Mum noticed my hesitation, and gave my hand a squeeze, just as my father pulled the wooden door down, and opened the door to the outside world. I couldn't believe how fresh the air was. It was unprocessed, unfiltered, lacking the telltale tang of chemicals that were used in the air conditioning to immobilize the virus that plagued humankind, which led to the lockdown. My mother told me she was not even born when the lockdown started, when the X2 virus swept the world and took almost the entire population of more than 8 billion people with it. But her parents were already married then. It was horrible. So horrible that the gruesome deaths my parents both, and every person born in their generation, had seen to befall the first generation to be infected, still haunted them till date. My mother herself had been there the day my grandfather died, and she never spoke a word about it to anyone. The slightest mention of a virus-related death sending her into a silence that took her days to climb out of. I tried to shake off the thoughts of death as I observed the vehicle. A military van. Judging by the build and synchronized movements of the three men who dismounted from the back and spread out in front of the only occupied houses in the street. The other survivors were out already. A family of two from a house I had always glimpsed from the study window and a lone girl around my age from the house opposite mine. I couldn't help but shoot her a sympathetic smile. She was only ten when her parents died, and I could still remember her cries as the people in white overalls and biohazard helmets took their bodies away. But she ignored me, flipping a blue streaked lock of hair over her shoulder as she turned to the men who approached her. I turned to them too, wincing as they gestured to my parents and I to move into the idling van, and I knew that they were doing the same to others too, so I didn't protest, even when my limbs locked in place for no reason. I felt a chill wash over me, like a bucket full of ice water. 
I could hear a roar in my ears, stealing my ability to think and turning my head to Cotton. I trembled, and my parents who had walked a few steps away from me turned back in worry. Millie? What's wrong? My mum's voice was layered in worry, and I knew she could sense my uneasiness. I glanced at the men behind them, already lifting the girl into the van, and felt a strange pulse behind my ear. I willed myself to breathe through the rising panic, to count the breaths as they came, and pull my leaden legs up with each breath I took, and soon I was right beside them. I looked up at my parents and smiled, but I knew it wasn't convincing enough. It felt more like a grimace than a smile, but I had to try. I couldn't give them a reason to worry, not when I finally had a name for what I felt, for the cold that took over my veins, not when I was afraid of being watched from one of the empty buildings at the end of the street by glowing beads of red. There were no windows in the van, and the doors were shut immediately the last person climbed in. So I was thankfully sheltered from whatever or whoever watched me from that window. I felt a phantom chill at the same point behind my ear and rubbed at it, feeling increasingly restless. Fear wasn't an emotion that I was familiar with, seeing as the only place I had ever known in the 15 years I had been alive was the interior of my little home that was once Telluride, a lively town with ski resorts in the mountain ranges behind it. It used to be a tourist hotspot, especially in the winter, but it was a ghost town now. As the van stopped, I felt a thrum of excitement and risked a glance at the boy who had been watching me all day. His eyes met mine, and when I blushed, I heard a snort from the girl. It was the first sound any of us, including the men in uniforms, had made since we got into the van less than 30 minutes ago, and it only served to increase the tension as the back doors opened. My mouth fell open, and I was sure the others felt the same surprise I did when they saw the sheer number of people that were arriving at a wide, empty space. And at the exact same time we did. I had never seen more than three people together in one place before that day, and I started to feel a bit lightheaded as I took in the crowd of wide eyes. We were herded out of the van, but the men refused to touch any of us, identical looks of repulsion on their faces. I could almost hear the condescension in their voices as they looked at the teeming crowd. Why they let any of these animals out, I have no idea. One of them spat, and I turned, ready to ask him what he meant by animals, when a deep voice boomed through the open space. Welcome back, survivors! All eyes turned to a huge makeshift stage where, surprisingly, a woman stood, with her arms wide and a sticky, unnatural smile on her face. Just looking at it made me sick to my stomach, but when I looked around, it seemed like everyone else was hooked. 113 years have passed since any of you, once afflicted by the virus that enslaved the entire world, had even stepped one foot or breathed the same air as the rest of humanity. I wondered just how long she could keep it up, how long she could maintain the obviously fake smile she had plastered on her face. I had to admit to myself that she was strong, strong enough to keep it till the very end of her long-winded speech. When I looked around, I saw that I wasn't the only one who felt bored. All the other kids of my generation looked like they were either ready to nod off in boredom, or in the case of the mysterious girl, ready to toss a shoe just to get her off of the stage. From the results of the last weekly testing, it is my pleasure to announce to you all that the Earth is completely free of X2. Everyone present, young and old alike, made so much noise in their happiness that I had to duck and cover my ears. I felt overstimulated. Like the roaring in my ears, courtesy of the crowd's cheering, drowned my final shreds of control. It didn't help that a tiny beam of red sliced through the air, just to rest on a boy's chest that was not even five feet away from me. As I raised my eyes to his, taking them away from the red dot on his chest and to the similar one on mine as reflected through his eyes, 
I felt my pulse quicken. My breathing turned shallow. I noticed him gesturing for me to keep my cool as I stretched to my full height. But I just had to look around. And what I saw chilled my bones. Almost every member of the new generation... Of the new generation. There was a red dot. I was in a permanent state of unease. And nothing that was going on helped me to calm down. All they could do was to hide it. But I could feel it in my bones. Like a chill that would never stop until I faced reality. Something was coming. But seeing as the red dots disappeared after a few hours, I decided to just let myself enjoy the day. All the people were separated into groups based on their ages, not long after the speech. And I was finally alone for the first time in my life. My parents were herded off with the other adults to a rehab center to prepare them for a successful integration into the new society. And all the kids remained right where we were. The only instructions we were given before they left us was to have fun exploring the village, but to be back in our homes at dinner and in bed on schedule. Our parents would be home by then, or so they said. I chose to ignore the glaring signs and knowing the glances all adults gave to each other. The silence as they let go of their children, just to go with the flow of excited teenagers pairing up and going to explore the town. Soon enough, I was alone, and walking in the most random direction I could take. A chill ran down my spine. I could feel something was watching me. Something unseen. A presence that seemed to follow me as I walked through the deserted streets. I shivered and looked around, but I saw nothing. Every person was very far away in the resorted parts of the city, but for some reason, I felt drawn to the deserted areas. The whole place just felt off, and with the echoes of people long gone, it was eerie. I kept walking, my eyes scanning the desolate buildings. I could almost feel the presence growing stronger, as if it was following me. I kept walking, trying to ignore the feeling, but I couldn't shake it. The further I went into the town, the more I felt like I was being watched. Finally, I came to an abandoned building and decided to take a break. I stepped inside and looked around, my heart still racing. I could feel a presence in the air. Like an invisible force that was watching me, and it made the skin on the back of my neck tingle. I looked around, trying to see what, or who, watched in the shadows but I saw nothing. I turned to the floor, to ceilings, to windows, and then quickly wished I hadn't, because the red beams watching my every move since morning weren't eyes. They were people. I gasped, fighting the trembling in my legs, and tried to quietly find a way out. They were in front, though. They would definitely be waiting behind, too, so I had no way out. Afraid they would find me if I stayed in that one spot too long, I moved into the cold bowels of the building, backing away from that cursed window. I should have felt something was off. The whole situation was off. First, it was so dark in the rest of the building that I couldn't see past the tip of my nose. Second, when I mistakenly kicked a mysterious object, the clattering on the floors was too drawn out. And third, while I was at a fork in the long, dreary corridor, my spine tingled when a gust of fresh air rushed past. A thought made me pause, and I brushed it off, continuing this time in the direction the air came from. The air led me to an open door, and I froze as I walked through it, finally understanding why I thought the air smelled off. The door led back to the alley. My heart dropped in my chest. There was someone else in the building, and I was being herded. My palms turned clammy, eyes widening as I double-checked, trying to make sense of the situation. I had two options. I could either wait for whoever was chasing me from within the building, 
or I could take my luck with the people on the other side of the building. I heard a scuffling beyond the entrance of the shadowed alleyway. It had to be the people who watched me. There was no other explanation. I would rather face whoever was inside. At least there would be a chance of survival. I snuck back into the dark building. I walked slowly, the blood roaring in my ears, my shoes squeaking against the cold concrete floor. The darkness beyond the door seemed to wrap around me like a cloak, and my heart raced with every step I took. It was so quiet that the sound of my heavy breaths seemed to echo, and I felt a chill run down my spine. I froze when a very tiny sound, like cloth on concrete, whispered behind me. I quickly ducked behind a corner, my heart pounding in my chest. I held my breath, my eyes straining to see through the darkness. Someone was following me. My body trembled. My eyes were drawn to the darkness of the corridor I had just stepped out of, and I could feel my heart beat in fear. The whisper of cloth on concrete increased with regular, light footsteps, and my heart stopped as a figure emerged from the darkness. I stifled my urge to scream, holding a sweaty palm to my mouth, when I saw the figure that was seemingly cloaked in darkness. The air shimmered, and I almost thought I heard a slight chuckle float through the air. I was frozen in place unable to move a single muscle. But then a scent caught my attention in the still air. I thought in situations like this, I would smell blood, or something equally repulsive. But the wraith-like figure smelt of something out of my mother's closet. It smelled almost girly. My heart seemed to slow down very painfully when the figure stepped out of the grip of the shadows, and I was stunned to see a lock of blue hair in the sea of black waves. She stepped into the faint light from the boarded up window right in the middle of the corridor, just before my hiding place. I huffed, rolling my shoulders to get rid of the tension that had set in, and walked up to her as confidently as I could, even with the tremble in my limbs. You scared me. That was the plan, she winked, throwing her long black tresses over one of her shoulders as she walked towards me, her gait smooth and unhurried. That wasn't funny. I folded my arms once she was close enough for me to see the grey streaks in her brown pupils. Oh, that was the fun part. What's not fun is letting those people catch you. I snorted, rolling my eyes at her serious tone and picked my way to the barred-up windows. Through the slits, I could see the streets beyond the building, and what I saw there made my veins turn to ice. There was a group of kids being herded into black vehicles, and for the first time since my own terror abated, I heard something similar. Screams. I stepped away from the window like the sight burned, and then turned to my silent companion. I knew she could hear them too. What in the world is that? They're taking the marked. Her voice was quiet, but still layered with a faint amusement that raked chilly fingers down my spine. What do you mean by marked? She walked even closer to me, quietly, until we were almost touching. But I stepped back, wrapping my arms around myself. The temperature had dropped drastically in just a few seconds. I think you know the answer to that yourself. My mind raced and I swallowed. I had recognized one of the kids being taken away. It was the boy I had stared at. The one who lived in the same street that I did. He had gotten a red beam of light on his chest. And so had I. She watched the horror fill my face taking every bit of colour being leached from my skin, and glowed with barely concealed glee. I decided there and then that I did not like her. The darkness of the woods surrounding the mountain ranges on the outskirts of town 
was near impenetrable. To me, who had never been outside of my small home, it seemed like a never-ending maze with no end in sight. I had been trudging after the girl, who never bothered to introduce herself after I had, for hours on end, and hadn't even felt the sting of exhaustion yet. This wasn't surprising in the least, considering the tale she had spun that was so unbelievable. It made perfect sense. The x virus started as a freak experiment, promising to provide everyone it had affected with quote-unquote superpowers. Superhuman strength, agility, the whole deal. It had worked, at first, but only at a great cost. The virus spread, and the vast majority of the world had to be locked down to ensure the safety of the people who caused the mess. Those who were never infected thrived in closed cities in different parts of the world and provided for the rest of the world in hopes the virus would be stabilized. They were right. It worked. And most of those who had not been infected had forgotten the reason the virus was made in the first place. The elites, though, never forgot. They placed themselves in the highest levels of government, biding their time, waiting for the population to settle so they could raise an army to take over the rest of the world. I shuddered just thinking about it. When I asked the girl how she knew so much, she said she used to sneak out of her home a lot and stumbled on the truth. She looked sincere, and she knew of a way out of the woods to a community of kids escaping the elites deep in the mountains. I couldn't help but think of my parents, but I told myself I would go back for them. Soon, a boom and crash sounded from somewhere very close to where we creeped, and I stopped, feeling a chill wash over me. The girl turned to me, a glimmer of what I thought was fear in her eyes, and whispered for me to stay low while she investigated what caused the noise. I nodded, and crouched in the shadow of a large tree, listening to her footsteps as she left. My eyes darted at every sound, at the snap of leaves in the wind, and at the crisp sounds of leaves being stepped on. My throat went dry at the last sound. I couldn't call out, not when I didn't know her name. The darkness around me felt oppressive, pushing me even deeper into the trunk I hid behind, sapping my energy until I was a nervous, trembling ball. Just when I thought I had escaped the presence that sought me, the night fell silent around me. That was the first indication that something was wrong. The second. Flames erupted with an ear-splitting bang in a semicircle around me, close enough to the back of the tree to singe my hair. My eyes darted, the fiery flames enclosing my vision. I was alone. There was no one here to help. I need a plan, I thought, breathing long, deep breaths seasoned with smoke as I scampered from the tree and into the clearing, trying to keep my heart pumping and my legs moving. The fight or flight response had never been as debilitating as it was in that moment, because it tried to hold me down in place and keep me from moving. My heart beat even faster, erasing the subconscious urge to stay, to wait to be saved, sending a blast of adrenaline to my limbs. I saw the wall of fire coming. I felt its heat as I increased my pace, every instinct I had screaming for me to stop. But I couldn't, not when ghostly figures in black tracked my every move from behind the wall of fire. I could feel the eyes on me, and I wasn't ready to go to them. I wasn't ready to become a monster. I ran to a tree and hauled myself up and passed the fire using the brittle branches that fell apart in my hands. And when I landed on the other side, the heat from the flames was enough to burn the hair off of my skin. Even as high as I was in the air, and I coughed as my chest tightened. From the smoke or from the panic, I couldn't tell. One thing I knew, though, was that I had to survive, or I would die trying, but only on my terms. So, I did the only thing I could. 
I ran, the wind nipping at my heels. I started with no destination in mind. But as I went on, ignoring the crashes in the forest behind me that told me my assailants were gaining on me, a blast of fresh air, untainted with smoke or heat, hit my nose. And I automatically turned, doubling my speed. I shook from the exertion, but I had to keep going. The sounds were getting even closer, and then I heard a howl tear through the chaos of the night. My bones turned to lead, but I kept moving. I couldn't stop. I wouldn't stop. If I did, that would be my end. I was being chased, and whoever or whatever was after me may have already gotten to the girl. The howling increased, drawing even closer. I could tell that it moved slowly, as though it fed on my terror. My legs moved as fast as they could, thorns and bushes draining blood as I moved past them. I jumped over a log in the path, muscles screaming with the effort, and kept moving, knowing that if I stopped, I would die. I stumbled on as the light coming through the trees changed to the blood-red light of sunrise. The howls faded into the distance, and I thought it was finally over. Still, I ran, and was jolted to a stop when a scream, female and begging for help, sounded from somewhere to the left of the path that I ran. It was long and drawn out, like the girl was being torn apart by a creature. I stood in place, debating. If I turned to help her, I would be caught. I felt guilty at the thought of leaving her to fate, seeing as she was the very reason I had the slightest idea of how to escape the fate they had in store for me. But I just wanted to leave. A creaking echoed, accompanied by a bright, hot red streak and the smell of burning pine, as a huge tree fell right in the middle of my path, barring my way. Disoriented, I tried going back the way I came, and discovered that the way back was barred by another burning tree too. Sweat dripped, mixing with the rising smoke and stinging my eyes. There were only two ways left to go. Left or right. My heart pumped faster as I ran to the left to help the girl. Streaks of smoke whizzed past my eyes. The forest was once again quiet, save for my breaths as I ran. I saw pale shadows in the trees around me. I knew I was being followed, but the thought didn't give me as much fear as what I imagined was happening to the girl. I had just run into another clearing when another boom echoed. I slid to a stop, narrowly escaping being squashed to death by the falling trees on either side of me, blocking my entrance and the way back. My heart dropped in my chest. She stood there, right in the middle of the clearing, unhurt. She called out to me, a strange expression on her face. I walked to her, a question forming on my lips and then noticed the shadows surrounding her. I screamed in warning and raised my hands as I stepped towards her, but my heart stopped as I saw her smile to the closest shadow. No, not shadows. I realized as I watched her stalk towards him with a beatific smile on her face. They were people, men and women, and they were all dressed in black just as she was. She looked at me with a smug smile on her face. I told you guys she wasn't that smart. Her voice hit like a blow to the head. But I turned to run, only to be cornered by two snarling beasts. Mutated wolves, unlike any wolf I had ever seen in the movies at home. These ones were larger, stronger, faster and from what I had experienced, even more sadistic. This was all adding up. Every irregularity in her story was adding up, and I almost cursed myself at how stupid I was. I couldn't run. Not anymore. I turned to her. 
Why? I asked, my voice quiet. You're working with the very people who made us like this. Who made the world like this. Why? Why else? My breath quickened in fear, but my voice stayed strong. I looked at her with my nose crinkled and arms crossed. That virus is the reason your parents are dead. She hissed, and I felt tendrils of fear escape through my throat. They are dead because they weren't strong enough. I am strong, and I will rule over the army to come in ways they have never seen before. She snapped her fingers at the people around her. Let's give her a head start, shall we? To see if she has what it takes. They nodded to her, and as she turned towards me, her eyes gleaming, my heart sped up as I realized what that look meant. It wasn't fear. It was excitement. I didn't look back as I ran straight for the only opening left in the clearing, and a few seconds later, I heard crashing in the forest behind me. It was futile. My attempt was futile, I could tell, but I had to try. One of the wolves attacked first, knocking me off balance and slamming me into the forest floor. The smell of death and rancid meat wafted from them, making my eyes water. My heart roared in my chest as I rained blow upon blow to any part of its body I could reach from my position on the ground. One of them reached for my throat with its sharpened claws, but I reached behind me for a round stone I had landed on and bashed it repeatedly into its skull. Disoriented by the smell of the red liquid now flowing from the gaping wound in the side of its head, I used all of my strength to push the stiff body off of me, running away as fast as I could before the other wolf could get to me. I ran even faster, stumbling into trees, all the while aware of the patter of feet following me, steadily catching up with me. But I could feel my strength flagging. I could feel my limbs slow. My eyes spun, heavy. I slowed to a stop. There was nothing more I could do. It was all over. When the girl walked towards my kneeling form, three minutes later, with a syringe in one hand. I made no sound. I was tired. So much for the day I gained my freedom. All things considered, I knew I was among the lucky ones. Regardless of anything that might have gone wrong before or after, I did wake up after 96 years of cryosleep. The same couldn't be said for all the volunteers. Everything started over a hundred years ago. The state of planet Earth was critical, and people were finally taking seriously the threat of human extinction. The result was absolute panic. A handful of spaceships left the planet in hopes of finding somewhere else to live or to hide in outer space while the Earth fixed itself. As expected, not everyone managed to get a place on those ships. Powerful people coped by starting wars. Hopeless people coped with mass suicide. And a small group thought it was a good idea to have a contingency plan so humanity wouldn't disappear forever. In case the world would recover, in case one of the spaceships ever came back for survivors, in case of whatever miracle, we needed to make sure there would still be some of us, asleep, safe, and waiting. This was the start of the Cryosleep Project. It was a very big and ambitious business. Many countries attempted their own version of it, and many religions called it blasphemy. It caused a lot of controversy. Nevertheless, the project gained traction until it was eventually completed. They guaranteed us that they had run enough tests and that it was completely safe. Sure, there was a tiny margin for error, and sure, they worked on it in a hurry and pressured by money and imminent death. 
but it was totally safe, they said. The thing is, it was very, very tempting. They offered a ridiculous amount of money to the family you left behind, and to you in a hundred years when you woke up. It was obviously a way to target desperate people and get them to join their experiment. Not that it meant rich people didn't join. There were a couple of politicians that were probably forced to join to vouch for the project. There were also so many celebrities desperate for attention and immortality that they had to put a limit on how many they accepted. But mostly, it was an endless list of underprivileged and hopeless people that would be picked at random. Unfortunately for me, I was one of those wretched souls. Sure, if the world ended, money wouldn't matter, but I had plenty of siblings, aunts, cousins, and relatives that, at the very least, could use the money to live their last years comfortably. I would die for any and all of them. In a way, that's exactly what I did. There were medical tests, psychological tests, background checks, and as much preparation as they could afford in as little time as possible. There were a hundred of us, meant to sleep for a hundred years. Fifty men and fifty women, ages between 18 and 60, with the majority, like me, in their 20s or 30s. Diversity of religions, ethnicities, and languages, except for the 20 spots used by politicians and celebrities, they chose a wide range of skills and professions. Doctors, nurses, engineers, mechanics, cooks, agriculture specialists, and plenty of young and healthy people that could do hard work in case we really woke up in a barren land and were responsible for rebuilding society. For better or for worse, that wasn't the case. I remember my last day. I remember saying goodbye to my family. Half of them celebrated me like a hero, and half of them cried and swore they'd try to forgive me for abandoning them. I remember going with all the volunteers into a building and being led towards the basement, supposedly the safest place in the world. I remember signing one last piece of paper saying that I was doing this willingly and then getting inside of my very own cryosleep chamber, lined along the almost endless wall. And then there was a melodic but inevitably ominous alarm. There was a sudden cold, not freezing or painful, but inescapable. And finally, full and absolute darkness. Until now. I woke up slowly, at first, just as they said we would. Then suddenly, with a painful shock of life and electricity coursing through my body. Nobody had prepared us for that. I tried to scream, and I'm not even sure if I managed it. My throat burned, but the sound didn't quite register yet. I tried to fight for my life, to get out of that unnatural coffin by whatever means necessary, but I wasn't even sure what I was doing. My body was violently shaking, and I tried to throw myself at the walls around me. I tried to punch and kick my way out of the slumber, out of the cryosleep chamber, out of my own body if I could. I was a prisoner. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't do anything. Until finally, the cover of the cryosleep vessel slid open and I was able to stumble outside of it, gasping for breath and overwhelmed by my own senses like a newborn baby. Someone, a nurse I think, caught me in her arms before I could hit the floor. At first, everything around me was blurry. Everything touching me was sharp and painful, and the sounds came at me as if I was underwater. My heart was beating frantically, and my trembling hands grasped at anything that could offer me a semblance of stability. But finally, my senses started to adjust. Although my sight was blurry, the sterile and mute colors of the laboratory were somewhat calming. A woman's hands ran soothingly down my back, and I could hear her voice saying, It's okay. You'll be okay. My name is Nurse Lucy Holland. I got you. 
there was an emergency, but it's all okay. You'll be okay. She repeatedly consoled me, until the very act of breathing stopped feeling like it was killing me. I was alive. I was awake. The cryosleep project succeeded. And I survived. The realization enveloped me like a warm blanket against the tremendous shock I had just experienced. I started to feel like time was slowing down to something more manageable. The woman who caught me had to repeat her name several times, but when I started to trust my brain again, I promised I would never forget her name. So, when she helped me sit at an examination table and started to take my vital signs, the first thing I said was, Nurse Holland, what happened? It probably would have sounded like an extremely vague question, but in the context of all, it was very obvious why I asked it. I was asking what happened to explain the chaos around me, because as soon as my ears stopped ringing and my body felt like my own again, I was able to notice everything else unraveling around me, and it did not offer a pleasant sight, nor comforting sounds. There was an alarm blaring in the background. So many people talking. Some voices were hushed and clinical, some were hysteric, and the cries and howls that filled the large subterranean laboratory where the cryosleep chambers were made me feel like I had woken up in the middle of a war. It should have been a simple question, but her face immediately turned concerned, and I was smart enough to guess I wouldn't get the full answer from her at that moment. We had to deal with a small and unforeseen technical emergency, she replied. It's nothing for you to worry about right now. I suppose she was right. It wasn't easy to search my cold and somnolent brain for memories of my past, and a headache was imminent. But I remember the instructions all the volunteers received right before we fell asleep. You'll wake up in a hundred years, they said. You'll receive the best medical attention we can provide and enjoy optimal conditions for your recovery for as long as you need. Then, they told us, you'll receive your share of the money and you'll be free to live the best life that the future can afford. With that deal in mind, I tried to relax. It was time for the medical examination. I had to answer a dozen questions about myself, my past, and the current state of my body. And then I could entertain myself by observing the technological improvements in the medical area. Everything was sleek and unfamiliar, and incredibly interesting to me. I watched Nurse Holland work for a while, and then, while she studied the results for a few minutes, I tried to get a good look at the rest of the huge laboratory. The cryosleep chambers were all lined along the walls and in front of each other. There was a sort of improvised infirmary where a nurse worked with each patient, just like Nurse Holland and me. But no, not everyone was like us. There were people moving frantically in all directions. Nurses, people in business suits, people dressed like soldiers. The stations to my left and my right looked perfectly normal, just like me. But beyond the next volunteer, to my right, the space was empty, save for a large pool of blood on the floor. The sight terrified me enough to make me look away, quickly, and wish that I hadn't seen that. What happened? Who bled that much? Why? Where did they go? For better or for worse, what I saw to my left was a distraction, but brought me many more questions. About three or four stations down the line, there seemed to be a fight. Not an argument, a big, violent, unforgiving fist fight. The kind of thing you know won't end until the participants are pulled apart and restrained or rendered unconscious. Who was fighting who? And why, I wondered. We've only been awake for minutes. What reason could a person have to fight another in just a minute of opening their eyes? 
All these questions, these doubts and uncertainty, quietly ripped a hole through my chest. It was the first time I experienced that feeling of emptiness, as if there was a void in my heart, deep enough to give me vertigo, even though I was sitting somewhere completely safe. I was startled to suspect that the dizzy and cold feeling didn't come from my surroundings, but from deep within me. I had no idea what to do with it. I looked up at the nurse in front of me and weakly attempted to joke to clear my head. It's kind of hectic here, isn't it? Kind of makes me want to go back to sleep, I said and forced a smile for her sake. I wished I would have done better. But as I said the words, I had a feeling they were somewhat true. I longed to lay down and rest and turn off my overheated brain again. What had happened to the overwhelming joy of coming back to life? I was pulled out of my thoughts by a soft, Oh, coming from the nurse. She looked back down to take notes of some secret meaning she found in my words. When she looked back up at me, she was wearing a similarly frail, but well-meaning smile. Well, Nancy, I am happy and honored to report that you are in very good physical condition, she said to me. We'll keep an eye on you and provide you with the basic package of vitamins, just to be sure. We can lead you to your room now. Right. Thank you, Nurse Holland, I said at least comforted by being part of a conversation, saying someone's name and looking into a woman's beautiful eyes again. But there was something that didn't feel right. This is a good thing, isn't it? I had to ask out loud, because something about her face made me feel like this wasn't exactly good news. She hesitated before speaking, and that only added to my spark of anxiety the pressure at the bottom of my chest. Ideally, we wouldn't tell you anything yet. Nurse Holland said softly, busying herself with random medical tools to avoid meeting my eyes. But the situation is so delicate that we received instructions to fully inform all healthy subjects on the general conditions of the project so we can move on as fast as possible. Move on? Informers of what? I wondered. Can I explain as we make our way to your room? She asked and offered me her hand. I accepted Nurse Holland's hand and realized it was the first time I purposefully touched another person in a hundred years, not as a part of the medical examination, just for the sake of it. I felt surprisingly deep grief when she let go of my hand when we started walking. Fortunately, the hallways were so chaotic and the people moving around us were so hurried that, more often than not, Nurse Holland had to put her hand on my arm or my back to guide me through. The entire time, she explained the dire situation that we found ourselves in. She said, A hundred years ago, a group of enthusiastic and well-meaning people started this project promising a million things they wouldn't be alive to see through. As you can see, the world didn't end. It didn't even fix itself. It just happened to go on and on. Things got better and worse, and then back again, and then here we are. There was progress, wars, improvements, economic crises, promises, contamination, all of it. And then somewhere along the way, we lost the investment in the hundred frozen bodies in some old building's basement. Don't get me wrong. This is still a historical moment, and I believe you're one of the most important people in the world right now. But not everyone agrees. We weren't prepared for today. Most people working here are volunteers descendants of the original volunteers. We just want to help you guys come back to us. I waited for a moment, hoping she would say more. I could tell she was probably holding on to a lot of information. 
but if this was enough to make it feel like the floor was opening up and preparing to swallow me whole, then maybe I didn't need to know more just yet. I made the effort to smile again at her and asked, So, is this your way of telling me you're my great-granddaughter? Nurse Holland looked surprised for a second, before remembering that a few minutes ago I told her I didn't have children before joining the project. Then she laughed, taken by surprise and seemingly delighted by it. No, not your great-granddaughter, she said, and almost successfully hid a painful look in her eyes. We arrived at my room, a small but functional little space inside the same building, a middle ground between a hospital room and a hotel room, for the volunteers to stay in while they decided what to do with their fortunes and their new lives. Nurse Holland welcomed me into my room, explained all the futuristic appliances that I wasn't familiar with, showed me the red button I should press if I had an emergency, and then, just like that, she left me all alone, with one more of her small smiles. Part of me wished she would have been cold, rude, heartless, anything that I wouldn't have missed so desperately and viscerally as soon as the door closed behind her. I tried to distract myself with all the novelties of the future, but one small room could get boring surprisingly quickly. No matter how much I could adjust the lights and the temperature and things like that, I tried to go to sleep, but this attempt was extremely short-lived for obvious reasons. I thought I'd never want to go back to sleep. There was nothing that unconsciousness could offer to me. Or at least, that's what I thought that first day. The solution to all these problems, to me, was obvious. I needed to get out of my room. I waited for as long as I could. Then, I opened my room's door slowly. Carefully. And I slipped outside. The hallways had considerably fewer people running through them but the few still going at it were too busy to pay attention to me. A couple of times I thought I would get lost, but to be fair, the trail of bloodstains on the floor and the stream of distressed people was a good guide to finding the main laboratory again. When I reached it, I instinctively knew it would be best if I tried to hide myself, discreetly moving from one abandoned station to the next, cowering behind shelves and examination tables if necessary avoiding people's eyes, anything to get closer and closer to the worst of it, to the spot where a large group of people were reunited. Most of the volunteers were gone, safe in the room like I should have been, but I couldn't help my curiosity. With the fewer people and less noise filling the giant room, the effect was much more dramatic. I could hear the echoes of footsteps, I could hear the bits and pieces of conversations, and, worst of all, I could perfectly hear the loud, angry, monstrous wail of a person in danger. How can you react to something like that? What was I supposed to do? Go back to my room? I needed to know more. I needed an explanation for the sudden cries, the warnings, and the tearful exclamations of everyone around. I stopped being so careful. I was convinced nobody would care about me, not in the middle of that chaos. I moved forwards, I pushed past a group of strangers, I couldn't stop, and finally, I saw it. There were dozens of people in a circle. On the outside, people in biohazard suits were sweating and looked scared out of their minds. In the middle, many nurses with uniforms, stained with blood and god knows what else with determined expressions on their faces, ready to help, even if the help they needed was brutal. The inner circle was a handful of tall and muscular men, with guns in their belts, but holding police sticks in their hands as they tried to reel in and control a... A man? A beast? What the hell was that? I couldn't make sense of what I was seeing. There was a man standing in the middle of the circle, but he wasn't like anything I had ever seen before. He towered over all of the other men. His bulging muscles that ripped through his clothes were unnaturally large. 
I was too far to get a good look at his eyes, but his expression didn't seem human at all. He was lost. He was feral. He was baring his blood-stained teeth, and he was drooling like a dog. I was horrified to look down at my own body, maybe less than half the size of his, and realize that we were wearing the exact same clothes. He was a volunteer, like me. I must have met him a hundred years ago, but something terrible and inhumane had changed in him in the meantime, because none of those facts I noticed could compare to the most troubling of all. The fact that he was standing there, with his arms by his side, but in one hand he was holding another person by the neck. A broken neck. A limp body. He was holding a corpse in his hands, as if it was nothing. I'm not sure if I started to shake or cry or scream, but someone must have realized I was another one of the volunteers, and, well, from what I had just seen, we weren't exactly well regarded at that moment. In the eyes of these people, that monster, that mindless killer, and I were related now. All I know for sure is that at some point a pair of hands grabbed me and I came face to face with Nurse Holland again. I'm sorry. She told me. This is the protocol now. Very swiftly, she stuck some sort of syringe on my right arm but I didn't have time to figure out what it was that she injected me with. Within a few seconds, I lost consciousness. For the first time in a hundred years, I woke up naturally. The problem was that I didn't want to wake up at all. That feeling of a dark pit opening up in my chest had taken hold of me, and it wasn't leaving. I felt like a void, with nothing but a cold breeze passing through me. I survived a hundred years of sleep. And for what? Money that I probably wouldn't even receive because the Cryosleep Project was a charity run by volunteers now? For a family that's all dead and gone and I'll never see again? For a world that doesn't care about me? A community that turned into monstrous murderers? A future that wasn't mine to see in the first place? I had to sleep. I had to go back to sleep, and I had to make sure I wouldn't wake up again. But I couldn't. I kept waking up. I kept opening my eyes. I kept tossing and turning in bed and needing the bathroom, and eventually someone knocked on my door. I think I owe you an explanation. Nurse Holland told me, after she convinced me to get ready and go out to have breakfast. The kind nurse looked almost as tired as me. But if everything else in the world was troubling, her smile was a constant, a comfort, and a luxury. I worked hard to return the favor with a smile of my own, but it wasn't easy. She led me to a wide cafeteria where volunteers, accompanied by their assigned nurse, ate breakfast along with the workers of the establishment. Then, Nurse Holland explained... You are among the lucky ones, Nancy. Even if it doesn't feel like it. Depression and trouble fitting in was expected, but there's more. There have been really unfortunate after effects in some of the volunteers, and it was all worsened by the fact that... <sighs> Look, the cryo sleep project was sabotaged. We bought off several sabotaging attempts throughout the years, but yesterday just... A religious group of fanatics, a sect that's not even as old as you are, technically. They got in. They vandalized the building and they ignited a malfunction in the system, resulting in all of you waking up ahead of time and under less than ideal circumstances. It's only been 96 years, Nancy. We improvised called as many people as possible and rushed here just in time, but we're only just starting to figure out just how the system malfunction affected the bodies of the survivors. We lost 30 lives because of the sabotage, and everyone awake is experiencing some problems. You saw the worst of it yesterday. 
What happened to him? I asked her, because I couldn't figure out anything else to say. I was numb. We couldn't save him. Nurse Holland, to her credit, told me the truth, and I was grateful for the lack of details. And what happens to me now? To the rest of us, I wondered, as I gave up on my breakfast halfway through. Well, you're all welcome to stay in your rooms for as long as you need. We're working on getting you the money you were all promised. Medical attention and checkups will be constant. We're also organizing support groups, so the survivors can connect with each other. There was a long silence as I searched my brain for something worthy to say. I knew I should have been shocked, angry, curious, distraught, or some burning and urgent emotion, but I couldn't find any of it inside of me. Instead, I looked into Nurse Holland's eyes and asked her, Who's your great-grandparents or whatever? We couldn't save her either, she answered. The next few days passed slowly. Or maybe they didn't. I didn't care enough to keep track of them. After a week, all the days started to look the same anyway. Nurse Holland worked as my caregiver most of the day, almost every day. She told me to start calling her Lucy, but I wasn't sure I deserved it. I was a terrible patient. I barely ate any food, and I only accepted my medicines because they didn't require any effort. I showered when she told me to, and I walked around the building when she held my hand, but on my own, the only thing I could do was try to sleep, and wish, desperately, not to wake up. I started going to the support groups, of course, but I couldn't remember meeting any of those people a hundred years ago, back when we weren't a charity case. We weren't monsters, we weren't ghosts of the people we used to be. Seeing the other volunteers didn't help me. If anything, I thought it was worsening my depression. The others were struggling so much more than me. I told myself I didn't care about them. I thought I was able to keep track of them only because, at night when I couldn't sleep, thinking about them made me feel bad enough to make me want to kill myself. It resulted in awful nightmares. That, at least, would make me feel something other than emptiness, even if it was an ephemeral shot of adrenaline. There was David, who developed a rash on every inch of his skin, and it worsened every day. Sometimes he started to bleed during our group sessions. Sometimes he was covered all in bandages, and sometimes he couldn't be there because his skin was falling off. There was Veronica, who woke up from the failed cryosleep experiment pregnant. Inexplicably pregnant. Everyone was scared to find out what she was going to give birth to. Then there was Enai, who had scales appearing on her body. Elliot, whose eyes had quite simply disappeared while he slept. Yvonne, who was growing half an inch every day. Graham, whose teeth were starting to grow out of his jaw. Fifteen names of people that killed themselves within the first few months. And then, there was me. Nancy Clayton. What can I say about myself? I was one of those supposedly lucky few that came out unscathed with nothing wrong physically, no mutations, no mysterious diseases, and nothing but crippling depression. There was me, a politician nobody cared about, teachers and doctors that left big families behind, engineers and scientists that didn't understand the new world, a pathetic little group, as I used to think of us. We lived one day at a time and attended our sessions just like everyone else. I sat there, and I listened to a celebrity brag about getting a book deal to share his story. I watched an 18-year-old celebrate the new red tint of his skin because it was making him famous. I stepped in to break up several fights, and I got into a few fights myself because it made me feel alive. It made Lucy put a bandage over the wounds every time. Sometimes that brought us much closer than just being another part of her job. I was so sure that I was a walking corpse, but but there were people crying on my shoulder during our sessions. There were strangers waving at me in the cafeteria. 
and there was Lucy checking in with me every single day. We were sick, and dying, and becoming unrecognizable things, but I had to admit that it was starting to feel like something I remember calling home. One day, during one of the support group sessions, everything changed. One of us, halfway through a conversation, broke down into tears, which turned into wails, and then into animalistic groans. He broke out into a new monster. A creature of pure rage without reason, and held us as hostages until security guards had to kill him right in front of our eyes. But I fought back, just like the others. We cried hysterically and rose from the floor, and attacked the guards, and tried at all costs to avenge our fallen friend. Our monster. Our brother. I screamed until I lost my voice. I cried for something other than myself, and I was kicked down like everyone else. But it was the very first time in a hundred years that I felt glad to be alive, and to be able to do something. Of course, this was the excuse that the people in positions of power had been waiting for. The cryosleep project was deemed a failure. Nobody cared about us if we weren't making a profit, or a spectacle of our transformed bodies and minds. We got kicked out of that old building, and forced to join society without an ounce of the fortune we were promised. But the kindness never ran out. Most of the nurses took in the patients they worked with for months. I moved in with Lucy, and with time, smiling back at her became as easy as breathing. Very often we welcomed one of my old friends into our home. Sometimes a few, sometimes our living room filled with people with strange bodies and terrible nightmares. Forgotten by the world, but never by their fellow volunteers. I realized that Lucy was right. The world didn't change. It didn't get any better or worse. But did it matter? In the grand scheme of things, the greed and cruelty of it could never compare to the small scale. The pure and simple feeling of knowing you have a family that loves you. I thought I lost mine a hundred years ago. But there I was, living proof that as long as there were people alive, some of us would always choose kindness and solidarity with each other. Hey sci-fi horror fans, it's Kira Rhodes. I'd like to take a moment to thank all of the amazing VAs that helped with the production of this video. You can find their links in the description. And thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this story, make sure to give it a thumbs up. Also, if you'd like to become an official member of our channel, you can do so by clicking on the join button. Membership starts at $5 only. And remember, stay cosmic.